I'd like to welcome you all to the symposium on the evidence for dietary recommendations, the role for nutritional epidemiology. Uh, this is jointly arranged by the National Committee on Nutrition and Food Sciences of the uh, Swedish Royal Academy of Sciences and the Swedish Food Agency. Uh, my name is Anna Winkvist. I'm professor in nutrition from the University of Gothenburg. And I will be chairing these sessions together with colleagues from the food from the Sweden Food Agency. And on the, this first uh, session, my name is Hanna Enroth. I'm from the Swedish Food Agency. Uh, and I'd like to introduce the first speaker. It's my pleasure to open to introduce Professor Birgitta Henriques Normark. You are the president of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, and you will be opening this symposium. So please. Well, members of the academy, ladies and gentlemen, most welcome to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and to this symposium that is about nutrition research in diet and dietary consumption. And as we heard, it's jointly organized by the National Committee here in nutrition and food science together with the Swedish Food Agency. And the Royal uh, Swedish Academy is a private organization that is independent uh, from the state and other authorities. And it was inaugurated in 1739. And the purpose was to promote science to really strengthen its influence in society. And among the first members were Hal Paul von Linné, but also Jonas Alström. And around this time, food science was a very uh, big interest of food science in uh, Sweden. And what Jonas Alström did was he actually introduced potatoes from France to Sweden. And the first member uh, that was a woman that was elected into the academy, that was Eva Ekeblad. And that was in 1748. And she was actually a food researcher. And she discovered that one can use potatoes to try to produce brandy. So the academy has a long history of food science research. Today, the academy consists of about 480 Swedish members and 175 foreign members that are divided into 10 different classes and covering many different subject areas. So the competence of the academy is really broad. And the academy is supposed to promote science. And one can say that we have four major tasks. And one is, of course, to award prizes. I'm sure that you have heard that we are awarding two of the Nobel Prizes in physics and chemistry. But also uh, the economy prize in memory of Alfred Nobel. And this is coming up very soon now. But we also try to build a scientific ground for evidence-based polit political decisions, what we call science for policy. And also more generally, try to see how we can strengthen research in Sweden. And uh, we also aim at being um, a meeting place for scientific discussions, like what we are having here today, organizing some posts and seminars and these kind of things. And the Academy has also established 18 national com uh, committees. And one of them is now in nutrition and food science that we experience here today. And these national committees, they are supposed to promote research and education and also give advice to the educational system, like for example, to universities, but also to the academy. And I find that the topic that we have on this symposium today is very interesting and very inspiring. Nutritional epidemiology is important for human health. And these studies often investigate uh, the relationship between diet and dietary consumption and disease development. And the results might actually improve human health and also public health. And I should say that I'm also very interested in public health because I'm actually working with infectious diseases. But this is another angle, I would say, on, on public health. So I'm very much looking forward to hear more about nutritional epidemiology and also maybe how we should think regarding diet for the future. And we also appreciate that so many of you come here today to this actually refurnished Bayer Hall that we're sitting in here that even got a prize for its light settings. And I should also say that, if you see, we don't have any microphones. So the sound system is very speci specific. So if you talk to your neighbor, be aware. Everybody might hear what you're actually saying. 
So once again, most welcome to this symposium. And I'm really forward. I think looking forward to this. I think it will be a very exciting day. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Birgitta Henrik Snormark, President of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. And now to the first uh, speaker of, um, of, the, of our invited guests, um, Dr. Julie Lovegrove from Reading University. And um, she's director of the Hugh Sinclair Unit of Human Nutrition there, and uh, has a long history of research in, in uh, cardiovascular disease and, and uh, dietary fats and, and so on, and was rewarded last year by British Nutrition Foundation for our outstanding re research um, efforts. And that would be enough <laughs> to invite her, but that's not why she's here. Uh, she's here because she's a deputy director of the um, UK Scientific Advisory Committee for Nutrition, second as we always <laughs> say. <laughs> Uh, and she's here to tell us about uh, the work of that, that committee. Please. Thank you very much. And I'd really like the, to thank the organisers for inviting me here to talk at this really exciting conference in this beautiful city. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about SACEN uh, and how we uh, assess evidence and some of that evidence that we've used in the past. Just to remind people that the Scientific Advisory Committee is a committee of the Office of Health Improvements and Disparity. We give independent advice on nutrition and risk of nutrition and health and disease. And we give that advice to the four UK governments, um, which is supported by Secretariat from OHID. And you can see here from, um, from Wales, Scotland, um, <laughs> UK um, and uh, Northern Ireland. So our remit is to look at uh, food, diets, um, nutrients, and also the definition of a balanced diet, to really look at the whole of the public population, including disadvantaged groups and also vulnerable groups, and also to look at health inequality issues. And we also give research recommendations for the above um, in relation to uh, nutrients and where we need to um, get to have more uh, evidence uh, for advice. I'd just like to um, emphasise that the SACAN actually just looks at risk, risk assessment. So we look at um, nutrients, as I say, and foods, and the risk assessment of that in relation to health and disease. However, policy is performed and developed by government, so for example, our sugar levy. And then the risk communication is by OHID, the Office of Health Improvements and Disparity. And these are just a couple of examples of campaigns in the past for sugar on the left and for salt on the right. So we're just looking at risk assessment and may differ from other advisory committees. We have a number of groups. We have two standing subgroups, and these are permanent groups, one looking at maternal and child nutrition, and the other one, which is a relatively new group, um, called the Framework of Methods for the Evaluation of Evidence that Relates Foods and Nutrients to Health. And I have the privilege of actually chairing that uh, particular subgroup, and we've been around for about three years now. And then we have working groups that are um, started when new evidence is uh, being viewed and then disbanded when the uh, publication has been, uh, has been uh, published. So I'd like to go into a few <coughs> details about the way we do evaluate evidence. And this is our latest uh, framework uh, publication. It was published in January of this year, 2023. We extended our range of products. We looked at approaches for grading evidence, which we hadn't previously got in our, uh, our framework, the quality of assessment tools, and also looking at statistical approaches to try and standardise the way we look at evidence throughout the whole of our uh, work. So the types of ed evidence we look at, we're looking at human evidence, effects uh, primarily, but also associations between nutrients and also um, dietary patterns and, uh, and health and, and disease. <coughs> we also look at intermediate markers like epigenetics uh, and look at nutritional status and health of functional outcomes. I don't need to tell this audience that the stronger ev evidence we can get is out of randomly controlled trials, where we have interventions and where we can actually prove cause and effect. But unfortunately, in nutrition, we don't necessarily always have solid evidence from randomly controlled trials. And sometimes we rely on prospective cohort studies as well. And look at systematic reviews and meta-analyses of these evidence base. 
We do so also look at genetic associations, for example, in our saturation in fat and health report, we looked at apolipoprotein E uh, polymorphisms. We also get data from national surveys, such as our National Diet Nutrition Survey, and also have relevant reports from national or international organisations like the WHO or EFSA, for example. And we have another group <coughs> of publications. So these are listed here. And there are different degrees of, uh, of uh, complexity here, with our reports having um, registration of protocol, looking at formal quality assessments with research recommendations. So these are complete in that way. And then we go to something like a position statement or a rapid review, uh, which uh, doesn't necessarily go through all of these different processes uh, listed here on the left. We may be interested to to know how we get um, our priorities for what we're looking at at SACEN. Different from other organisations that look at the whole diet on a regular basis over perhaps five years, we actually look at different um, nutrients or, or components of the diet um, as they become priority. And we have horizon scanning where the committee can bring ideas to um, the, the, the SACEN committee uh, of particular interest. And an example of this recently is uh, we're going to look at iron bioavailability. You also get requests from government or government organisations, and an example of that is our uh, latest report, which is looking at processed foods and health, and that was the government wanting a rapid report on, on this particular aspect of ultra-processed foods, which is very topical at the moment. We also get requests from interested parties, but also in response to emerging issues arising from UK or international expert bodies. And an example of this is perhaps our response to COVID uh, when we, uh, a few years ago, we looked at the impact of nutrition and COVID, particularly vitamin D. So responding to priorities as they come through. I just want to very briefly explain how we are now standardising the way we use our evidence. And this saw um, the assessment of the quality of evidence, which is really important when you're trying to look at advice. So we have six quality assessment tools that we actually looked at and chose the ones that were most relevant. So for systematic reviews of randomised or non-randomised study, we compared that of AMSTAR 2 and ROBIS. So that's the, um, a measurement tool for assessment of systematic reviews and also risk of bias in systematic reviews. And we looked at data we previously, previously assessed when we looked at low-carbohydrate diets in adults with type 2 diabetes using uh, these quality tools. And I found that AMSTAR 2 was very robust. It was easier to perform and also in a more timely fashion. So we have now recommended that all of our evidence is um, assessed using AMSTAR 2. We recommended the revised tool for randomized trials um, as a tool for randomized uh, assessment. For non-randomized study, we uh, tested two to to tools, Robbins 1 and uh, NOS. Uh, which is the Newcastle um, Ottawa scale, and chose the Robbins one. And then for published reports or guidelines, we're recommending Agree to tool. So when we look at our um, methods uh, going forward and our reports and uh, publications that we produce, there's going to be a standardised approach and they can be very comparable. In our previous framework, we didn't actually suggest any uh, tools for looking at the certainty of evidence, but we have indeed produced our own tools for reports including the carbohydrate and health report and the saturated fat and health report and the low carbohydrates in adults with type 2 diabetes. And we actually developed these tools to align with those particular assignments. But we wanted to be much more standard and we assessed four of the tools as I, I've listed here uh, in looking um, at the evidence. Um, when we first looked at Nutrigrade and Helm, we um, required we found that they required detailed evaluation of the individual studies and therefore those were then rejected for our use. We went on to compare GRADE and the U USDA dietary guidelines to a set, um, to a, of the advisory committee. Again, we assessed one outcome for two of our previous reports that we'd written. So one, again, was the low carbohydrate uh, and uh, to treat adults with type 2 diabetes and the, the other one, uh, was looking at feeding children between one and five years. And when we looked at the GRADE and, and the USDA DGAC, 
We found that grade seemed to be more appropriate for our, for our needs. It was again transparent, uh, there was judgment required, but it was very open when it, that was. It was easier to apply, and also um, it, was, uh, it was a timely uh, way of doing this. And so, again, we recommend grade um, for all of our reports going forward. When we actually look at uh, giving guidance, we base our uh, evidence on the totality of evidence that's available at, that, at any particular time. And we make recommendations on strong evidence and those that are considered as high or moderate. <coughs> However, in some cases, uh, we have said that we might be able to make conditional recommendations on evidence that may be limited or um, is graded as low certainty. And the reason that we've included this in our framework is if you use the grade system, when we look at the um, certainty of evidence, all prospective cohort studies actually come in as low. So if we didn't accept this um, type of evidence, then we wouldn't be able to use this evidence in any of our recommendations. But if we do use this uh, low-grade evidence, then we need to um, have a, a, rest, a justification for it, a rationale such as a precautionary principle. And we also give research recommendations used by a lot of the government's uh, research councils to um, align what their money is spent on uh, in, in relation to what is required to increase our evidence base for dietary advice. So since SACCON was founded in 2000, uh, we started, we took over from the Committee of Medical Aspects um, of Food. We've published about 43 publications and I've just listed a few here. Our latest two publications is that of Feeding uh, Young Children from 1 to 5 Years, published in July of this year, and also our um, statement here on processed foods and health, again, <coughs> published in the summer. This is what we're working on at the moment as a committee. We have our subgroup on maternal child health, uh, still looking at 1 to 5 years. We've got our framework committee, again, <coughs> updating our framework as, um, we, as was required, and we had a meeting a couple of months ago, and we're going to have another update of our report in the next few months. We have a working group on nutrition and maternal health, looking at the moment at um, BMI. We've also got the vitamin D fortification working group, and a joint SACAN and committee on toxicity group, looking at plant-based milks. So this is what we're looking at at the moment. We also have um, subjects on the watching brief, we call it, and we're going to, at some stage, look at the definitions of whole grain and also sustainability, which is a key topic of this particular symposium today, and I know that's been taken into consideration in a number of the Nordic um, guidelines. And this is something we are looking at in the future to, uh, to spend time on. I wanted to give you an example of some of the areas of which we've looked at and the evidence we've used for guidance. And first of all, I'd like to start off with folic acid. So it's a long history of our recommendations to government to fortify um, our food with folic acid. And this starts from even before SACAN was founded uh, with this um, publication here from the Committee on Medical Aspects of Food. And you can see here we're down to 2023, um, and I will go through briefly the history of this. So in 2000, there was a publication where we stated that there was evidence um, to suggest that if you have an additional 400 micrograms a day of folic acid in your diet, this will reduce the risk of neural tube defects in mothers um, by half. And also that an intake of 600 micrograms a day, that's the additional 400 with the recommendation of 200 micrograms per day for the general population, cannot be achieved by all women of childbearing age through the fortification of flour without exposing older adults to, um, to higher intakes. And we know that if you have a high intake of folic acid, it can mask the detrimental effect of lower B12. So we have to look at the risk um, benefit of this. We then went on um, to look at the risk benefit. And you can see here from this graph that 200 micrograms a day is sufficient to prevent deficiency. We're recommended 600 for pregnancy to reduce neural tube defects. When you get up to 1,000 a day, we're getting into the stage where you can get this uh, risk of adverse effects. So it's really important if you're thinking of fortification to ensure that you're not um, exposing the population to high levels. We then went on to recommend the government again to fortify the flour uh, with folic acid in 2006 and 9. We developed another report in 2017 
saying that the evidence published since the second previous report on the potential adverse effects of, of high doses was not substantial enough to change our recommendations. So still, again, recommending fortification. Still, the government didn't uh, produce policy on this. We then wanted to determine in 2017 what is the prevalence of um, neurotrudiv defects within our population. And you can see here, actually, it's relatively high, with almost 500 cases a year. And this is a, a prevalence here of about four, nearly 15 in every 10,000 live births. So quite high uh, incidence, and therefore a requirement to consider folic acid still. This is some data quite complicated um, a slide here I've shown. But of the people that we know um, uh, about taking uh, supplements uh, in relation to folic acid, you can see only 28% of the women took folic acid supplementation preconceptually. It's about we recommend it for three months before uh, conception of 400 micrograms a day um, and for the first time in trimester of pregnancy. And only 28% of the people that, uh, that um, we recommended that you actually took that. And of course, this was even lower in the younger age groups in those disadvantaged groups. And of course, not all pregnancies are planned. And so people haven't got sufficient uh, uh, folic acid and certainly aren't taking supplementation. We then were very keen to see what is the status within our population at this time. And this is some data from the age group across the top here of different groups within our population. And then our markers of folic, um, folic acid status. We've got uh, red blood cell folate and also serum folate. And if you look at the women of childbearing age, they have the lowest status of all of our population level. And if you look at those percentage that are below the concentration um, that is related to neural <coughs> tube defect threshold of um, 748, nanomoles per litre, 91% of our women were below that. And that, you know, is a really shocking statistic. So we really did need to consider further this fortification of folic acid. Of course, to convince the government of the importance of this, um, we needed to, to look at the change uh, since, since we, we last um, advised this. We went back eight years to 2008, and we found actually that there was a 31% a reduction in red blood cell folates in women of childbearing age in the, the previous 10 years, up into 2018, and a 20% increase in the proportion below the threshold. So actually the situation was getting worse year on year, despite that ha the fact that we had voluntary fortification of, of food with folic acid, which some, some companies were, were doing. But unfortunately, because there wasn't this drive by government for policy, a lot of this fortification was actually falling out. So the levels of intake were reducing. It's also important to determine whether fortification works. So we looked at data from the US, which looked at the proportion or the prevalence of neural tube defects before fortification. And they split this by different uh, ethnic groups with um, uh, Hispanic groups at the top here, white non-Hispanics and black non-Hispanics. And you can see here, the level is just under 11 per 10,000 before they fortified. And if you remember back to when we looked at our um, level in our population, it was nearly 15. So we were higher than these levels in the 1990s in the US. Fortification was then um, recommended, and you can see this significant drop here in new true defects. And this has been maintained over the years. And this was data that was published in 2015. Um, and, and the last date here was 2011, and, and the, the levels are about similar today. So it does work. We had evidence to show to government that it does work. We were actually um, in, interested in modelling the scenario. So within the UK diet, we needed to determine whether if we fortified flour with folic acid, how that would impact on the population's intake, but also whether it changed people's percentage that over the upper limit. And when we did modelling, or this was done by the Food Standards Scotland, uh, we found that with increasing um, fortification here uh, within bread, you can see that there was a reduction in those below the RNI and only a very small increase in those above the, the um, upper limit. So we found that it was practical to do this. And we were absolutely delighted um, on the 20th of September 2021 when the government announced that folic acid will be added to non-wholemeal bread flour across the UK to help prevent neurotube defects. 
Now, if you look at that date, 2021, we still haven't got mandatory fortification of our flower. So we are still waiting, and this has been over 23 years in the making. So we're delighted that the government has agreed to do this, but very much <coughs> looking forward to when this actually becomes policy. So sometimes these things can take a large number of years, and in the case of UK and folic acid, decades. I'd also like to show you just one example of how our advice then was uh, changed and converted into policy. And an example I'd like to use is the Carbohydrate and Health Report, of which I had the privilege of sitting on that working group. We published our report in, in 2015, and we looked at both randomly controlled trials and prospective cohort studies. And at this time, when we, did the re when we wrote the report, we commissioned systematic reviews and meta-analyses to be um, to be performed for us. So we had one for each of our outcome measures and uh, related to the different carbohydrate sources. So we looked in here at dietary fibre, starches and also sugar. We redefined um, the definition of, of dietary fibre, but I'm just going to concentrate here on the evidence that we had for sugar. And you can see here the key findings were that sugar consumption increased the risk of, uh, of uh, consuming too many calories. It was associated with increased risk of tooth decay, and also, sugar-sweetened beverages were associated with increased risk of type 2 diabetes and also higher body mass index in children. We therefore redefined our um, definition of sugars. It used to be non-milk extrinsic sugars, which was complicated for us, let alone anybody else. So we wanted to make it clearer. And we defined it as now free sugars to be adopted in the UK. And then we also um, reduced the population average intake from 10% total energy, as it was to 5% total energy from anybody over three years, uh, two years uh, and above. And the government responded to this to make this policy uh, in recommending uh, this 5% um, this or less than 5% in the population average. And we, they produced a sugar reduction program. And within this, the background was this, was an, uh, an estimating if we could achieve the 5% reduction in sugar over the next 10 years, it was estimated that we'd save over 4,000 <coughs> premature deaths over two, uh, 200,000 uh, dental caries cases and saved the National Health Service um, a considerable money. So what they did is they announced in the government obesity plan in 2016 their sugar reduction programme, setting the ambition for all sectors of the food industry to voluntarily reduce the sugar intake by 20% by 2020. And this did, in fact, um, stimulate reduction in sugar in a number of different foods within the UK and a slight reduction in our mm -hmm. sugar intake uh, within the UK, particularly from confectionery, although our chocolate intake slightly increased, unfortunately, in a compensating manner. We also, or oh, the government then introduced the uh, soft drinks levy, uh, or uh, commonly known as the sugar tax in 2018, mm -hmm. to encourage manufacturers to reformulate soft drinks and reduce sugar intake. And in fact, they did this, and again, our uh, intake of um, sugar-sweetened beverages has reduced with the substitution of more low-sugar low or diet varieties. I'd also like to um, just end by saying that we do, as members of SACN, um, comply with a code of practice, which is written down in our, our SACN code of practice here you can find on our website. We are very transparent and open about any interests we may have. So declaring any interests we have um, in relation to our, uh, our day jobs, in relation to research. <clears throat> Unfortunately, these declarations of interests are sometimes misconstrued as uh, conflicts of interest. And this is just one headline in uh, 2015 when our carbohydrate report was published, where a number of us on the committee were um, accused of being um, uh, conflicted because of some of our uh, uh, industrial funding for our research. Um, and in the UK, often to get a research council money, we're encouraged uh, to, to, uh, uh, to um, collaborate with industry. So unfortunately, this declaration of interest is sometimes misconstrued as, as being conflicts, and I think this is something we need to, to look at as, as a group. So I'd just like to conclude by saying that Sir Sacken provides independent scientific advice on risk assessment only of nutrients and related health issues. We look at the totality of evidence, um, systematic reviews and meta-analyses. We are responsive to relevant topics that may come up. We also look at dietary recommendations for government policy development and also research recommendations. 
before I finish, I'd just like to thank all of my, my colleagues on SACAN uh, since I've been a member of, of the committee uh, for over 13 years now. Uh, inspirational scientists, I've learned so much uh, from them. And currently, Ian Young, who's our chair. And also the um, secretariat we have from OHID and previously um, Public Health England that support us in all we do. And in fact, we couldn't do anything without their support. And then I'd like to just finish by thanking you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Lovegirl. So we will open up um, for some questions. And it's just to raise your hand and, and speak up if you have questions about the work of SACAN or the work of government or... Well, I, I would like to, to ask you, um, among all the topics that is possible to, to do, <laughs> to do some, some review of, where does the prioritization of, of topics take place? Do you have, at second, do you have an influence on that? Yeah, no, absolutely. And as, as I said, there are a number of different ways in which topics can be brought up. We have this horizon scanning, which we have every year on, on our committee. And individual members of, of SACAN can bring these. And then what happens is we look uh, in the context of what is required uh, from government and also the priorities that are around at the time. And we look at the order in which the, we should... Um, we should assess the particular aspects. And we have this watching brief, as I say, sustainability is yeah. on that, yeah. uh, and other outcomes, such as the definition of whole grain, which I think is quite complex, which we will come round to as and when um, the other topics are signed off and resourced um, within the Secretariat and time becomes available. That's really good, because then you can act quickly on, on some things like the, the COVID updates, uh, for example, too. To reprioritize, sort of. And, and the ultra processed foods was something government brought to us when we really wanted something within a year, which is quite rapid, uh, you know, yeah. to turn around this evidence base. We, we did do it within that time, but, you know, we were able to do it um, uh, because we could prioritize that over others. Mm -hmm. And when you, have a, when you have a topic then, how do you set up a committee? that fits to, to that purpose? Yeah, so we have working groups that we set up. Um, we have experts from SACAN that sit on those working groups, but we can also co-opt other members, mm -hmm. experts from outside the committee to work on that particular area. Uh, we usually have the chair of that committee. We used to have someone that um, was expert in that area, but we may have someone that is, is definitely relevant in that area, but, but may have a, a different overall view of mm -hmm. that particular subject. Mm -hmm. Very interesting presentation. I just wonder, um, how do you, you use the work of other organizations or countries? I mean, qualified systematic reviews produced on other topics. How are they implemented? Are they implemented at all? And how do you organize this work to duplicate the work of other comparable organizations or countries? That's a really interesting question. Um, and what we previously used to do, as I said, with our carbohydrate in health report, is we used to commission systematic reviews to be done fresh. Uh, and uh, that, did, that takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of uh, resource. Um, so what we have try, tried to, to do now is move away from commissioning um, systematic reviews, but use those that are previously published. Mm. And so we may have a number of systematic reviews that are produced by other organizations uh, like your own or other groups of people that we then use for our evidence base. Mm. And I think that's really important because we don't want to duplicate um, effort, uh, you know, and it is important to use other people's um, evidence if we can. We do assess those on our own basis because they may not necessarily be, necessarily be totally relevant to our population, but we certainly look at the totality of evidence. And I think it is important, perhaps in the future, if groups of us get together to try and establish ways in which we can help each other when we have common topics of interest. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you, Yuli. Very interesting. I, I was a bit uh, uh, puzzled by the how you describe the the government uh, uh, taking up your advice and so on. Uh, I'm, I'm not very skilled in political science, but it, it, uh, it's it's kind of interesting. And then I would like to ask you how you feel this gap between science and committees and and the Swedish government or the Nordic in any other. Uh, situation uh, because it felt like it were more your like counterpart than someone who also thrived for a better health for the population. Mm. 
So, so our, as I say, SACON is looking at risk assessment and we, we give advice to government on risk assessment of nutrients and diets and, and the like. And it's up to the, the government themselves to actually make the policy. So we're not involved with policy development. No, I understand that. And yeah. so it obviously depends on the priorities of the government at the time. Um, generally, they take our advice on. So, for, for example, after carbon price <coughs> report, we change the recommendations to, to 5% or less than 5% of energy to sugar and increase the dietary fibre recommendations to 30 grams a day. But in the case of folic acid that I highlighted in my presentation, uh, they haven't, uh, until until now, actually produced the policy. And it do is you know why? Or? I, I suppose it is complex. We, we have just looked at our flour regulations. Of course, we fortify our flour with other nutrients, such as calcium and iron. <coughs> um, and it has impact on other aspects, I suppose, or on the economy and the like. Um, so we, we are com confused as to why they haven't taken it on. We're delighted they have now recognised it's important. But again, we are waiting for it to happen. There's no guarantee, unfortunately, we're just giving advice. But for Sweden, this was not the case to, to suggest fort uh, fortification of flour. Do you have any more insight into that? No, I, no, I don't. If, if, if we have, if, if the same was recommended to the supplement. Yeah. No, we don't have any No, we don't. We haven't discussed that, really. The, the Swedish policy is the, the fortification currently, but things can change, of course, mm. and then we try to keep... No, keep I, I recall it was up uh, several years uh, mm. when this first report came on on the neural tube effect, but then there was also this increased adenoma risk. Uh, so I think the decision was to support supplements rather than fortification. Mm. Yes, we have more questions. Thank Please. you, Thomas Eroholm, Uppsala. <clears throat> I wonder whether there are any differences between the UK recommendations and other countries' recommendations, like the EPSA, or I don't know whether you know about the Nordic Nutrition Recommendations. Are there any particular differences? And I, my second question is, I realize that the meat industry is strong in the UK, as everywhere, and the, if you have any, well, we have had this discussion now on uh, decreasing the, the meat intake. Uh, do you have a similar discussion in the UK? Yes, yeah, so to your, so your first question, there are, there are differences. We, we do have some food-based recommendations, and a number of countries are uh, going to hear about food-based recommendations from Denmark. Uh, uh, we, we have some food-based recommendations, but we have a lot of nutrient-based recommendations as well. Some of them aren't identical. Um, for example, vitamin C in the UK is different from the US. Um, uh, for, for, as an example, we don't have any absolute recommendations for dairy. I know in the, the new recommendations for the Nordic re recommendations, you have a, some for dairy. So there are differences, I think, uh, with, with, uh, with some of the recommendations. I think broadly they're very similar, to tell you the truth. Um, in relation to, to um, sustainability, this is something, as I say, we are interested in looking at. But the Scottish Food Standards Agency is very keen to, to look at sustainability and, and uh, look at ways in which we can try and um, uh, reduce the foods that are related to the environmental impact, and they are looking at that at the moment. Yeah. Okay, one There more. is one more question. We can have the last question. Just say who you are, please. Thanks. Um, I'm Conor McDonald from Karolinska Institute. Um, so, at SACIN, you guys are making recommendations for the UK public as a whole. Mm -hmm. But as I see it, the evidence is not coming from representative samples of the UK public ever. Do you take that into account and how? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. You're right, we can only look at the evidence that's there. Of course, our population, if we think about it, um, we have only over 60% that are overweight and obese. So actually, the majority of our population aren't of normal weight, for example. So we have to think of all of the groups of the population. Um, and so the, we do look at the evidence and we try and um, use that that is related to the general population rather than looking at clinical studies, for example, uh, on patients. But we did um, just, I, I mentioned that we did look at the impact of low carbohydrate diets in adults with type 2 diabetes, which was unusual for us to look at a particular clinical population. But of course, type 2 diabetes is increasing quite a lot within all of our populations, UK and, and, and elsewhere. But we try and use the evidence that is relevant. But as you say, it's not always all there. Thank you very much for asking those questions so wisely. Uh, 
in the committee here, we have um, made a small donation in, in, as a token of to show that we appreciate that you have been um, participating with us today. So we made it to to Nelson Sokoti, and oh. we'd like to say thank you for. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> So, our next speaker is from Spain and the US, Dr. Javier Garcia de Albunas, uh, Director, Epidemiology, RTI Health Solutions in Spain, and also a collaborator of the Causal Inference Lab, the Causal Lab at Harvard School of Medicine, uh, Public Health in the US. And you will tell us about the technique target trial emulation as a means of strengthening the evidence of observation studies. And this really ties into what Julie was telling us that, of course, when we make recommendations, we would like to base them on the best evidence that is from randomized controlled trials. But unfortunately, in many areas, like the area of nutrition and health, we don't have RCTs for all the questions that we address. So oftentimes, we have to rely on observational studies. And Javier has for long been working with a group at Harvard who has developed this new technique to try to strengthen the evidence from observation studies. Please. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for the invitation. I'm honored, truly honored, to be here to talk about <coughs> analysis of observational studies in nutritional epidemiology following the paradigm of, of a target trial. My talk will have three parts. The first part will be an overview of the target trial emulation framework. The second part will be a case study using a pharmacological intervention. And, and the third part will be a case study using a dietary intervention, and this one is probably the one that you will be most interested in. Okay, so as a context, I always like to start with these slides uh, that reflect that science thrives under challenging times. In World War I, there was a huge development of plastic surgery to meet the demand of uh, taking care of wounds in soldiers. In World War II, there was a mass production of penicillin to take care of, again, soldiers that were injured in the battlefield. And now we just lived through a pandemic. And in this pandemic, we had a huge um, healthcare development, which was the use of mRNA vaccines. These vaccines existed already, but they had they had never been used for to, to prevent diseases. But we were among this pandemic and we had to, to develop them. How did the scientific community develop these vaccines? Using clinical trials. That's the gold standard to develop a new healthcare intervention um, <clears throat> to prevent a disease like mRNA vaccines. And these trials gave us the, the information uh, required to know that these vaccines were efficacious and they were safe. And Using those trials, these vaccines were deployed at a massive scale. But there were unanswered questions about those trials. These trials were relatively small and relatively short because we needed to use the vaccines as soon as possible. But there were questions that had not been answered. We didn't know about safety or efficacy in special populations, like pregnant women. They were not uh, enrolled in clinical trials. We didn't have information about uh, rare events. There are uh, adverse events that might be rare or might happen late, that, and we might not have found those in randomized trials, but those are uh, important. We didn't have head-to-head -head comparisons, so there were many unanswered questions by these randomized clinical trials, and we needed answers. Well, uh, we got answered from observational data, from observational research. So there were a number of studies published in major journals, in uh, New England Journal of Medicine, Annals of Internal Medicine, Nature Medicine, that answer these questions uh, using observational data. And policymakers used these uh, studies, these articles, to inform their policy decisions. <coughs> well, all these studies use the target trial emulation framework. So, in a unique situation in human history, where we had to develop a mass intervention without, uh, <clears throat> without having the full picture on the efficacy and safety, the method that we used uh, to obtain that information was the target trial emulation. Mm -hmm. There are some journals, like Annals of Internal Medicine, that um, if you're going to submit an observational study to that mm -hmm. journal, 
they're going to ask you to frame it as a target trial emulation. So there are already journals that, there that won't accept your work if it's not following this approach when you use observational data. So what is emulating a target trial? It's a tool for causal inference. Uh, you know that with data, we can do three things. We can use the data to describe the data. We can use the data to predict some outcomes, depending on other outcomes. And we can use the data to do causal inference, which is trying to, know, to learn what works and what doesn't work. Or what happens if I intervene in the world doing this versus, versus if I don't. The main tool to do causal inference is the target trial emulation framework. And it stems on the fact that for each causal question of interest, for any research question that is causal, you should be able to come up with a hypothetical randomized clinical trial that would answer your question. If you have a research question and you cannot figure out what would be the trial that would answer that question, maybe your research question needs to be reformulated. So the target trial emulation framework has two steps. The first step is thinking about this hypothetical trial that would answer your research question. And the second step is finding data and trying to emulate the components of that hypothetical trial using those observational data. This table is the main tool for target trial emulation. And if you start reading uh, articles using this, this approach, you will see that this table is pretty much in all of them. This table contains all the protocol components of a regular randomized clinical trial, the eligibility criteria, treatment strategies, treatment assignment, outcomes, follow-up, the causal contrast, and the statistical analysis. And then in the column in the middle is where you dream about your ideal trial. It's where you write how you would design that hypothetical trial to answer your research question. Once we have that column uh, filled in, then we move to the column on the right, which is the emulation. And is where you have to explain how, we, how you are going to emulate each of the components. Some of the components will be easy to emulate. For example, the eligibility criteria, you can just use the same ones that you had for your hypothetical trial. Others will be more, more difficult. Uh, <clears throat> for example, treatment assignment. In your hypothetical <coughs> trial, you would be randomizing people. And, but when you use observational data to, <clears throat> to emulate that trial, there is not randomization in observational data. So you have to explain how you are going to emulate that randomization. We're going to see this in action with two case, case studies. Which are the main uh, benefits of framing your observational study as a target trial? The first one, and I learned this not in the classroom but by practice, is that it makes discussion about your project easier. Because many people that you will have to interact with, um, clinicians, patients, policymakers, statisticians, will be more familiar with reading or discussing a randomized clinical trial than discussing an observational study. And once you have come to an agreement with them on which is the ideal hypothetical trial, most of the key points for your design are already set up. The second advantage of this framework is that it reduces the chances of bias. And the key here, and I will come back to this uh, several times, is the alignment of eligibility, time zero, and the start of follow-up. Those three components. Those three components are by design aligned in a randomized clinical trial when you identify the eligible population you randomize them and start following them from there. Those three elements are very well aligned. In observational analysis, um, these three elements are not always very well aligned, and that can be a source, a source of bias. Another advantage of target trial emulation is that you need to be explicit about your treatment strategies. Uh, you won't be just comparing drug A versus drug B. You have to write uh, for how long drug A needs to be taken and it, in which situations patients can stop the drug. The same way that you do in a clinical trial protocol. You cannot force people to take a drug if they ha are having toxicity. So you have to follow the same principle in, a, in this framework. 
And the fourth advantage is that it gives you a set of methods, a set of uh, statistical methods to study treatment strategies that are sustained over time. And we will talk about this also in the, in the case applications. So <clears throat> let me go back to the alignment of these three components, eligibility, time zero, and the start of follow-up. Those of you who have taken uh, courses on epidemiology, there is, I'm sure you are familiar with the, fair, with the first example. This is presented in every Epi 101 uh, course, which is the Women Health Initiative Randomized Clinical Trial. <clears throat> this was a, a case of the use of hormone replacement therapy and the incidence of coronary heart disease. In the late 90s, we have several studies, several observational studies, saying that hormone replacement therapy prevented coronary heart disease. That was good. But then the, the scientific community decided to actually run a randomized clinical trial and randomize women to taking the hormone replacement therapy or not. And what this trial found was completely the opposite. They didn't found, find no effect. They, they found a deleterious effect. So completely the opposite. This was embarrassing for epidemiologists, right? The problem here was that eligibility time zero and the start of follow-up were not well aligned in the original observational studies. And Miguel Hernan and others reconciled the, the, the estimates uh, using this framework, the target demolition framework, and the same observational data that they used for the original study, and they got the same result as, as the randomized clinical trial. The second example is the one that we are going to review with more detail <coughs> in the second part of the talk. <coughs> now I'm going to present uh, the application of this framework to a pharmacological intervention. This case study is about the effect of taking statins on the incidence of cancer. We published this uh, 2019 in, in Nature Medicine. The motivation for this study was that, again, there were many uh, observational studies that were reporting very protective effects of statins <coughs> on the incidence of different types of cancer. And they were published in major journals. They were published in New England Journal of Medicine, American Journal uh, of Epidemiology. And they were saying that, uh, for example, for lung cancer, there was almost an 80% an relative risk reduction if you take statins versus if you do not. So it looks, looked like statins were very good to prevent cancer. The problem here is that after these observational studies, we had 20 randomized clinical trials who actually randomized people to receive statins or not. <coughs> and when you meta-analyze those 20 trials, the odds ratio is 1.02. When you actually run randomized people to statins or not, the effect, there is no effect on the incidence of cancer. What's going on here? I know what you are thinking. You're thinking, well, the problem is confounding. The problem is randomization because randomized clinical trials randomized people, the observational studies did not randomize people. If that is the reason of the discrepancy, we are done. There is nothing we can do about unmeasured confounding because it's unmeasured. If it's not measured, we cannot adjust for that. But there can be other reason. And, uh, and the other reason can be that there is not a proper alignment of time zero, treatment assignment, and eligibility. So what we did in this case study was apply, applying the target trial emulation approach to see what's the result and to see whether we had to blame residual confounding or we had to blame um, a, a, design, a design feature. Okay, this slide is very busy, don't worry, I won't go over the, all the sentences that are here. <clears throat> this is just to show you um, how this case study actually used the table that I presented before to specify what is the target trial, and we specify the eligibility criteria, treatment strategies, treatment assignment, and how we then explain how we were going to emulate each of the pieces. I wanted to mention, I want to mention two things here. One is the treatment strategies. In our case, the treatment strategies that we compare were initiation of any statin and continue taking the statin during the study follow-up 
unless you have a contraindication. If you have liver toxicity or, or muscle toxicity, you can, you can stop the drug. And the control strategy was no initiation of statin during the follow-up unless you have an indication. If you have a LDL cholesterol over a specific threshold, then you can start statins, of course, because that's the, the indication of statins. Another thing that I want to, to highlight here are the causal contrasts and the statistical analysis. In a randomized clinical trial, you usually can estimate two causal contrasts. One is the intention to treat effect, and the other is the per protocol effect. The difference is that the intention to treat effect estimates the effect of being assigned to one group or the other. You don't care about what happens after randomization. The per protocol effect is the effect under complete adherence to the, to the strategy. They can give you the same results if everybody in the trial adhere, uh, took the drug as they were supposed to. They can give you different results if there is an, uh, incomplete adherence. The other thing that I wanted to highlight here is that even if you randomize people to one intervention or the, of the other, if you want to estimate the per protocol effect, you need additional adjustment because the benefit of randomization only happens at time zero. When you randomize people, the, your two groups are uh, exchangeable on average, but only that day. After that, things will, will happen that uh, might make those groups not comparable anymore, and you need to account for that. In this case, we use uh, a statistical method called inverse probability weighting that consists on censoring people when they stop following the strategy that they were assigned to, and then weighting that censoring using uh, the confounders that you have measured up, to, up there up to that time point to adjust for, for possible differences. <clears throat> In this case, we had a problem because those who start statins in my observational database have a very clear time zero. The day they start the statins, that's when I will start following them. But for the control group, the intervention is no statins. So what is time zero? Um, because during the, if, the, if during the whole study period somebody doesn't take statins, when should I start following that person? In this case, there are many ways to handle that. Uh, one way is just choosing one single time. So whenever they become eligible, that's not your time zero. Another way is choosing all eligible times. Um, to do that, you emulate, instead of emulating one single trial, you emulate one trial per month or per week of your database. And that's what we did here to, to gain some efficiencies. And these were the results. On the left are the intention to treat effect. Uh, and you can see that the hazard ratio was 1.02. And on the right is the per protocol effect, which is very similar. The hazard ratio is 1.01. So we obtained exactly the same result as the randomized clinical trial did, as opposed to prior pre pre observational studies. And you might be thinking, well, maybe your data were, were better than the data that other observational studies used. Maybe you have more confounders, and that's why you obtained this, this result. To see whether that was the case, we reproduced with our data exactly the same design that other observational studies have used. <coughs> Specifically, we classified uh, individuals on the basis of their observed duration during the follow-up. That's something that that's not very safe to use in, in observational data. And when we did that, we also obtained very protective effects. So with this sensitivity analysis, we show that the discrepancy with our, with our approach using target emulation and prior observational studies was not confounding, was a design feature, something that you can address with, with, with a design that uses a target emulation approach. <clears throat> okay, let's go to the third part, which is probably the one that you care about. <laughs> the application of this framework to a dietary intervention. This is something that has been uh, already explained, which is that studying drugs and studying food is very different using uh, <coughs> observational data. When we study drugs, we usually have a lot of randomized clinical trials out there because that's what regulators use to approve 
a drug. So there are usually randomized trials published that you can use as a, as a, as a context, as a framework, as an expected uh, efficacy and safety of your interventions. The applications of real-world data in, in pharmacopoeidemiology are mainly for to study uh, special populations, populations that were not represented in clinical trials, or to evaluate long-term safety. The challenges of analyzing real-world data in pharmacopoeidemiology are confounding and measurement error to a certain degree. When we study foods, things are much more complicated because randomized clinical trials are rare. There are some, some, some trials, but they are not as common as clinical trials in pharmacopoeidemiology. The next best, alterna the next best alternative is uh, real-world data. And the challenges that you face here are much larger. You have the challenge of confounding, you have the challenge of measurement error, but the magnitude are much larger than in pharmacopoeidemiology. Because if we want to study one drug versus the other and we want to know the confounders, we can go to the doctor and ask them, which factors do you, do you consider to prescribe this drug or the other? And they will tell you, oh, performance status, <coughs> performance status liver function, um, prior fractures. They will tell you why they use one or the other. Those are the confounders. With diet, we don't know. People eat whatever they want to eat. And then you have the problem of measurement error. In pharmacoepidemiology, you might get information from claims, from <clears throat> disease registries. Uh, well, those are relatively accurate measures of, of treatment. But in, in dietary intervention in uh, epidemiology, you have to ask people what they ate for the last year. Uh, and that's, that's subject to a much larger measurement error than, uh, than the one we have in, in pharmacopoeidemiology. So we have three options here. Invest on more randomized clinical trials, which still will face some uh, challenges, uh, logistical, for example. We can try to use our best methods to analyze real-world data, or we can go home, give up. <laughs> Stop doing research and, and do something else. So here I'm going to promote the second, the second option, which is using the best possible epi method to analyze real world data. <clears throat> Before I move to the actual case study, I want to talk, talk again about the intention to treat versus per protocol uh, effects. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, in a randomized clinical trial, when you estimate the intention to treat effect, you you only care about baseline. You only care about what happened day at day zero, in which group they were. You don't care about the rest. It's just the effect of being assigned to one group of the other. When you estimate the per protocol effect in a randomized trial, you care about the whole treatment history, because you want to estimate the effect and the full adherence to one intervention versus full adherence to the other intervention. When we use real world data, it's very similar. There's observational analog of the intention to treat effect is only cares about what happens at baseline. You don't have randomization, so you will have to adjust for differences somehow. And when you estimate the per protocol effect, uh, again, you care about the whole treatment history or the whole dietary history. Why is this important? Because when you are estimating the observation and analog of an intention to treat effect, you only need to worry about baseline confounding. You only need to worry about differences at day zero. And you can, you can deal with that in observational data with any standard epi method. You have matching, standardization, mm, propensity score weighting. There are a lot of methods. They should work pretty much the same. They have different modeling assumptions. But when we, when we want to estimate the effect under full adherence, and this is usually the case in nutritional epidemiology, we want to estimate the effect of following this diet during the 20 years, right? Then you need to adjust not only for baseline differences, but also for post-baseline differences. Why, why am I mentioning this? Because the methods that you need to adjust for that are not that standard, are, a little, are a, little, a little different than standard epi methods. These are usually called the G methods for generalized methods, and they include the parametric G formula, inverse probability weighting, and G estimation. In the prior application, uh, we used inverse probability weighting. In the application that I'm going to show now, we're going to use the parametric G formula. 
this is all I'm going to explain about these methods. Uh, I, I won't go into, into the specific details. So the case study was uh, published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition and estimated uh, the effect of the American Heart Association dietary goals from, published in, on 2020 on mortality. This is a summary uh, of the food-based American Heart Association dietary goals. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Um, they just have uh, several food groups, whole grains, fruits and vegetables, fish, processed meat, sugar sweetened uh, drinks, legumes, nuts and seeds. And they have some recommendations per serving of servings per day or, or per week. So this target trial <clears throat> wants to estimate what is the effect of following these recommendations versus not following them on the 20-year risk of death. On the actual article, you will see that the, the authors compare up to 14 different dietary strategies, but for this uh, presentation, we're going to focus only on two, on two strategies, which are no intervention, just keep on following whatever you were eating, uh, before ignore these recommendations or follow all the recommendations. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, here the causal contrast of interest is the per protocol effect, so the effect under full adherence to the to the intervention and the methods that they use was the, the new formula to adjust for post baseline conformity. The the data that was used for this study were the Harvard cohort, the Health Professionals Follow-up Study, Nurses Health Study, and Nurses Health Study 2. I'm sure you're familiar with this. These cohorts uh, collect uh, medical history, lifestyle, and health conditions every two years via questionnaires, and they collect uh, dietary information via food frequency questionnaires administered every, every four years. And these are the results. Um, on top, we have the, the graphs for each of the, of the cohorts, the health professional follow-up study, nurse health study one, and nurse, nurse's health study two. And you can see that people <coughs> who follow these dietary recommendations have uh, better survival than those that, that don't. Uh, at the bottom, we have the, the effects on all cause mortality, both in a absolute, uh, absolute scale as a risk difference at 20 years, the prevention goes from 4% to 2.6% and on a relative scale. They also present uh, the effect on cardiovascular mortality and on cancer mortality. And they also run an analysis on external causes mortality. What are external causes mortality? Accident, accidents, falls, poisoning. And you might be thinking, why is this relevant? Why is this outcome relevant here? Well, this outcome is used here as a negative control outcome. Uh, if um, a negative control outcome is one outcome that we know should not be affected by our exposure and that could have the same uh, confounding structure. So if you don't find any effect of your intervention on, on this negative control outcome, that's reassuring against the presence of residual confounding. So in this case, they didn't find an effect of the dietary recommendations on external causes of mortality, so that was uh, reassuring. So to finalize, what are the benefits and limitations of this framework? One of the main benefits is that it clarifies very well the, your research <coughs> question because it, it, it's, it's formulated the same way as a randomized clinical trial would do. That will be very useful uh, for policymakers or for patients, well, not patients, but people considering adopting these interventions because it will be very clearly written uh, or what, what, what these are. It also estimates absolute risks under different uh, dietary strategies. And <clears throat> this framework uh, gives you the opportunity to use G methods to adjust for uh, time varying confounders. One example of a time varying confounder in this setting is a newly diagnosed disease that could be affected by prior diet and can be prognostic uh, of your outcomes. And the last slide. Which are the limitations? Well, you still have problem. You, you still can have problems with a measure confounding, measurement error, and model misspecifications. But uh, a 
apart from baseline confounding, a randomized clinical trial does not solve this either. <coughs> um, and the last bullet is something that I was discussing with some of you earlier, is that you can only do this if you have high quality, rich longitudinal data. If you don't have proper data, it doesn't matter which stats or which design framework you use, uh, you won't be able to get uh, straight results. Thank you very much. interesting and very pedagogical description of this new technique. I think we have time for maybe one or two short questions from the audience if we have anything. Yes? Um, thanks, super good. Um, so yeah, like you say, uh, the Harvard cohorts have got great every four year FFQ follow up. Uh, us in Europe, we don't really have that. Um, so what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's why I have the last bullet. <laughs> you need you need good data to try to to estimate the long term effects and and reduce the chances for for biases. If you have a shorter follow up, you can consider whether you still have information that is valuable. Valuable. Uh, you still can run analysis that bring us a valuable information at that shorter outcome. Uh, and otherwise, maybe just wait to gather more data. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for that. But that's an important point that we need good. Okay, one final question. We'll take Agneta. Okay, uh, thank you, Javier. Uh, this, uh, compared to the real world eating beh uh, habit, I think you had on the previous slide, what is that? And how should we think that the control realistic dietary strategies. Is that what we should aim for in terms of developing guidelines? Are you following me? So I think that if you are going to recommend something, you're saying that what you're recommending is that you're recommending something because you think it works. Um, then that should be based on a causal inference study. Uh, then it's up to you how you design that causal inference study or how, or how you weight the evidence regarding causal inference that, that recommendations are coming from. What I presented here is one framework to do uh, causal inference with observational data. Um, it's not the only one. It's one that I think is the most robust nowadays. Um, so if when, when you do a recommendation, my point is when you do a recommendation, it's because you think it works. And that's a definition of causal inference. What works, what doesn't work. Okay, I think we'll stop here. And again, thank you very much for being here. Talk more about the Nordic Nutrition Recommendations 2023. And the first speaker to introduce is Rune Blomhoff, who chaired the Nordic Nutrition Recommendation work. He's also a professor at the uh, Oslo University at the Medical Science Department, Human Nutrition Research. Please. Thank you for inviting me and uh, to arranging such an interesting symposium. So, I would like to explain to you how we have developed the new Nordic Nutrition Recommendations. So, most of you know that this is a long-standing collaboration between the Nordic countries. We have collaborated since maybe 1960s, or at least the 1970s. The first common Nordic Nutrition Recommendation was published in 1980. Then four more editions have uh, followed. and. Um, this, the, the Nordic Nutrition Recommendations are really science advice to the national health authorities, food and health authorities in Nordic countries. And I think it's fair to say that they have served as a main scientific foundation for the national health authorities and health professionals and the scientists and the food industry in the Nordic countries for in these years. So in 2016, the Nordic Council of Ministers initiated an, a new update. 
So from June 2017 until December 2018, we had a pre-project where we developed the project description and secured funding from the Nordic Council of Ministers and the, the health and food authorities in the Nordic countries. And it was also decided to, um, in addition to the five Nordic countries, also to invite the three Baltic countries to participate in, an, in this edition. And we defined three milestones in that period that was accepted by the Nordic Council of Ministers. Milestone one was to update the recommendation for all nutrients. All the nutrients should be updated. The second was to develop a framework for food-based dietary guidelines and develop that much further than that has been done previously in the NNR history. And the third was really a novelty, and that was to integrate environmental effect of food consumption <clears throat> into the framework for food-based dietary guidelines. So then in January 2019, we engaged in this massive project and it went on for three and a half years and then we published our report, our main report in June this summer. I will first tell you a little bit about the organization of this huge project. The NNR committee, which is in the middle here, it is made up by two representatives from each of the countries, of the Nordic countries, and one from the Baltic countries, scientists. And these are really the, the committee that drives, the, that have, have been organizing and driven the whole project and been responsible for formulating the food-based dietary guidelines and I have the sole responsibility for setting the dietary reference values. There has been a steering committee with the members from the health authorities in the Nordic countries we have had a very strong scientific advisory group with members from authorities doing similar tasks, for instance, in US, Canada, uh, um, in UK, WHO, in EFSA, and from World Cancer Research Fund, and also from the Science Review Center in the US, and also the, the latest um, um, head of the NNR committee in 2012, Wolf Becker was also participating in, the, in that scientific advisory group. So we have uh, had a very strong science advice from this group. They, they have, have also in, uh, influenced our methodology and principles, and we have used them a lot during the process. In addition, we have also established a specific systematic review center and you will listen to Agneta Oksan later today, uh, how this systematic review center have worked and developed the Nuvo qualified systematic reviews for the NNR project. And in addition, we have commissioned specific work, work to more than 230 scientists, multidisciplinary scientists on different topics, specific topics, for instance, the 36 nutrients or the 15 food groups or the dietary patterns, and they have developed um, <coughs> background papers and methodology papers to, to the NNR project. So it's a huge project, and a lot of people have been involved in this, this massive project. So the whole first year we discussed, more or less, the whole first year we discussed methodology. And we paid particular attention to the methodology that has been used by the National Academy of Sciences and the Institute of Medicine in the US. And also more recently by, by, by EFSA. They have developed a lot of, of very useful methodologies and principles. And we also, um, have, of course, have dig deep into the methodologies as have been used in the previous edition of, N of, of uh, NNR. So we worked to, to harmonize the methodology, pick the best, develop it further, uh, both for setting DRVs, dietary reference values, and for formulating food-based dietary guidelines. Um, as you know, and you have heard of in the previous um, uh, lecture, assessment of causality is really a core in setting dietary reference values and formulating food-based dietary guidelines. And to, when you review the, 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 the in previous editions, 
typically classically in uh, when developing in these guidelines we have used so-called narrative reviews expert groups doing their best without no, not too much systematic analysis in, in, the, in, the, in the reviews it has developed further to, to so a little bit better quality scoping reviews more systematic reviews there in this in this uh, this field uh, area there are some thousand systematic reviews out there and they have very different quality some have bias they are biased by the authors or there are other biases in in those systematic reviews so we cannot take they for granted so that is why we developed in inclusion and specific inclusion and exclusion criteria for qualified systematic reviews that could <coughs> guide us when when developing our guidelines so these qualified systematic <coughs> reviews are the main scientific foundation of nnr 2023 and we have identified roughly 100 such qualified systematic reviews and using our novel inclusion exclusion criteria and then we also identified novel topics that were not covered by those previous qualified systematic reviews because we would not like to duplicate what has been done by other authorities and we had the open call and we had the delphi process to, to identify that took several months to identify the specific topics the where we would like to dig deep and develop the new qualified systematic reviews and in addition to this during this process we were also invited to to, to, to develop six um, qualified systematic reviews for EFSA. And that is also an illustration of the, if we just use the same type of methodology, we could, we could share resources and we could, could also cover um, topics that would be built elsewhere, otherwise not been covered. So I think we had, we had we, we have tried to use cutting edge methodology, our novel fundament for assessing causality, qualified systematic reviews. We have tried to be as transparent as possible for every step. Um, we have a lot of quality checks, quality checks and balances to, um, to, to, to improve the quality. And, um, and uh, we use very much the same type of, uh, of quality assessment tool as presented in the first lecture. We have a novel framework for integrating environmental effect of, uh, of food consumption. And then I think we have also a very democratic process since several hundred scientists have been involved in this, this, this project. Another new feature in NNR 2023 is that we, the, the target group is the general population. In previous edition, we have used the health, healthy population. No, it is a general population and only those specific um, segments of the population that are excluded, they, they are mentioned specifically. Otherwise, it is for the general population. And of course, the methodology and principle, they have been peer-reviewed uh, by scientific advisory group as well as, as peer-reviewed before publication in journals. So, then back to our milestone one, <clears throat> update the full range of uh, recommendation for 36 nutrients. So then what we first did was to, and I show you here some examples of those qualified systematic reviews. So first topic was that which qualified systematic reviews exist for each individual 30, of these 36 nutrients. And here you see some examples. There are some from 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 uh, from the committee, as you have seen there, uh, there are some from uh, from uh, from uh, from NASA, National Academy of Science in the U.S. There are several from EFSA, and there are several from from different main organizations. So then we have identified the qualified systematic reviews. Then we have determined: do we do we need to have a specific the uh, novo qualified systematic review of any of those? 36 nutrients and then we commissioned uh, to, to, to experts to write the scoping review 
of each individual nutrient and integrate these scoping, these uh, qualified systematic reviews into the scoping review. And then we have recalculated all DRVs in, in NNR 2023. That has never been done before, recalculation of every single NNR uh, uh, DRV. So, and we are very explicit so that it is transparent documentation for every step. You can see, I can find every step, and that is unusual in dietary reference, dietary reference values guidelines. It's very often very hard to find where does the, 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 the calculation come from. Now we try to do it very explicit. We have new representative weight curves for the Nordic and Baltic countries. The Nordic and Baltic countries are among the highest in the world. That is why we have representative weight curves. We have selected to use BMI 23 as a target. Uh, it's a little bit higher than EFSA and, and NASA, but we have selected to use BMI 23 as in the previous for adult. It is scaled down for, 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 for children, of course. Then, based on this, we have new reference weights for, for energy. For all age groups, we have new reference weights for new reference weights for reference uh, for energy. Then, our primary um, uh, DRV <coughs> that is average requirement. That is what comes out from the data. Then we deter determine average requirement in the live stage group. That's our primary assessment of the of, 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 of data. And um, to, to, uh, to, this, to, to determine the average requirement, we need to be specific on what is the indicator for setting average requirement. So we are very explicit telling what is the indicator for setting that specific uh, average requirement. And of course, then we need to assess causality. There is when, where causality comes into account when setting the RVs. That is to, to set the causality. Is a, we would like a strong evidence that this indicator can be used for setting average requirement. Then based on the, on the CV, we, we derive recommended intake ba based on the AR. If there is not enough evidence to have to strong evidence for causal uh, in indicator, then we use what is called adequate intake, which is and the mean intake in an apparently healthy population. This is more uncertain, and based on this average uh, intake, we calculate provisional average requirement. It's more, we indicate that it's more uncertain, that is why we call it provisional AR. And that is because we have not enough significant data to have a strong uh, evidence for causality. Then we have tried to we have harmonized the life stage groups because the age groups in previous edition of NNR in EFSA, in uh, NASA and other organizations they have not been the same. For instance, group one age group one to three years. Some use one to two years, two to four years, and one to five years, and 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 have one digit for all, all the, those those stages. So. We have harmonized those values and given the most representative life stage groups that are most similar to EFSA and to, to NASA. And then we have been very explicit on the type of scaling because the average requirement is typically set only for one life stage group. We have data only for adults, for instance, and then we need to scale down to, 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 to children or to infants. And then we use different sorts of scaling. We are explicit on which scaling we use, type of scaling we use, and what factors goes into the scaling. And then we are also explicit about the how we round up the, or down the values. So all this to try to explain how we have recalculated, how we have you try to be transparent in the recalculation. And based on all this, 
we have then now come up with seven nutrients that receive one or more um, dietary reference values for the first time in, uh, in NNR history. For instance, vitamin K, biotin, pathogenic acid, choline. Choline is now included as a nutrient, not before. Manganese, molybdenum, fluoride, all of those receive uh, DRVs, one or several DRVs for the first time. And we also, uh, and nine of the nutrients changed recommendations by more than 20%. More, many of the nutrients changed a little bit, and some changed a little bit more, like these. So vitamin E, vitamin B6, folate, B12, vitamin C, calcium, thiamine, zinc, and selenium changed more than 20%. And for each of these, these nutrients, we have a very specific showing, describing what is the reason for this change. Is it the weight change? Is it a new factor that is come, come into account? Or what is the reason for this change? So that is uh, milestone one. The second milestone is to, to develop a framework for dietary guidelines based on health effects. So first we assess health effects of 17 food groups, or 15 food groups and, and dietary pattern and meal pattern. First again, we identify existing qualified systematic reviews. We had a Delphi process to determine new de novo systematic reviews, qualified systematic reviews that could be developed by the systematic review center. And we commissioned um, for all these 17 papers, uh, scoping reviews. And to develop quantitative food-based dietary guideline, we require that first, that the overall evidence is categorized as strong evidence according to the criteria basically developed by World Cancer Research Fund. It is similar to the grape, uh, but we uh, in 2012, World Cancer Research Fund criteria was used, and we felt that the, it was uh, it was um, um, uh, very relevant also to use it this time. But it's very overlapping with the grade as discussed in the first presentation today. So if it could be defined as strong evidence by these predefined criteria, and a dose curve has been established in, in qualified meta-analysis, then we developed quantitative food-based dietary guidelines. Alternatively, if a food group is considered a key group for nutritional adequacy in the population, then we also have some quantitative food-based dietary guidelines. And one example of that is dairy. Because if you take out dairy from the Nordic and Baltic countries' diet, then you would have a high risk of, of having or increasing the number of calcium and iodine deficiencies. So that is, that is another argument why we have quantitative food-based dietary guidelines. Qualitative guidelines, if the overall evidence is categorized as strong, but high quality dose response curve cannot be established. And one example is how we assessed red meat consumption. We, it is strong. Our evaluation is that there is strong evidence in qualified systematic reviews that red meat, high intake of red meat, is associated with colon cancer. That is our indicator for, 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 for red meat. In pros prospective studies, there is significant association. There is dose response curves in qualified meta-analysis. We have a number of mechanisms that have been described and discussed that work seem to work together in a plausible way to increase the, the risk of, of colon cancer. And we have also clinical trials, intervention studies, where you can on intermediate biomarkers endpoints. For instance, that you can see that, that meat intake increased the, the incidence of, of, um, of DNA, oxidative DNA damage in the intestine, for instance or similar types of, of intermediate biomarkers. So, so we consider epidemiology, mechanisms, and clinical trials with intermediate uh, endpoints. And altogether, 
this is helps us to, 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 to establish strong evidence for causality or, or convincing uh, evidence for causality, just like the word cancer research from methodology describes. And this is the dose response curves. And in the, the, the CUPE report from World Cancer Research Fund, which is a qualified systematic review, and there is a qualified meat analysis. And there you can see that unprocessed red meat, uh, there is a significant uh, increase, for instance, for, with 50 gram per day, which is similar to 350 gram a week, <coughs> both for unprocessed meat, red meat and for processed meat. They did a separate analysis for unprocessed red meat. And um, so there is a strong evidence for increased risk for colon cancer. There is a dose response curve, which is the indicator. There's a non-linear dose response curve. And there is supporting evidence from other diseases, such as other cancers, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases. But on the other hand, meat also contribute in the Nordic and Baltic country with many essential nutrients, such as iron and vitamin B12. So we would not like to reduce the, the intake of red meat too much. So that to balance those two, two arguments, we have uh, decided that it would be wise to, to, to advise that meat should be low and not exceed 350 gram per week. So that is based purely on health uh, considerations. Then, milestone three, we have implemented um, the environmental effects of food and based on, 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 the, on the climate report, on the, on the biodiversity report from the UN, we have assessed uh, five, we have also commissioned five separate uh, background papers on sustainability. And then we concluded that the um, healthy and environment friendly dietary guideline a predominantly plant based diet, high in vegetables, fruit, berries, pulses, potatoes and whole grains, ample intake of fish and nuts, limited intake of red meat and poultry, moderate intake of low fat dairy products, and minimal intake of processed meat, alcohol, and processed food containing high amounts of fat, salt, and sugar. Where are we at for time? Five minutes. Five? Yeah, yeah. Five. <laughs> so, and then, so this is the overall advice. And then we have been very specific on what is based on health, and what is based on the environment. And this is illustrated in this. So first, all the uh, quantitative guidelines are based on health. So for cereals, 90 grams per day of whole grain cereals, vegetables, fruit, and berries, 500 to 800 grams per day of a variety of vegetables, fruit, and berries, nuts, 20 to 30 grams per day, fish, 350, 300 to 450 grams per day, from sustainably managed stocks. So that's important to note. Pulses could be a significant part of the regular diet. <clears throat> we had a not, not enough data from qualified meat uh, for, for, for those response curves. That is why we have uh, not a quantitative on pulses. So that is mainly set by health and then is supported by the environmental effects. They are there is a synergy. There is a similar. There is both beneficial for the health and for the planet. Then we have one advice which is purely uh, dependent on on environment. That is advice on potatoes, because potatoes there is they are sort of neutral for health. I mean, not I'm not talking about potato products, but whole potatoes, cooked potatoes, boiled potatoes. They are they are neutral for health. But they could be a significant part of the diet in, in the regular diet in, in, in Nordic countries because of the low environmental impact of, and, and they suit very well to be grown in the Nordic and Baltic countries. And they have plenty of nutrients that would be healthy in a total diet. And then moderate intake of milk and dairy, uh, 350 to 500 milliliter per day of low dairy uh, for health, preferentially lower, depend on nutrients in our overall diet. And that is due to the environment. So we would not like to increase the likelihood of calcium and iodine and other nutrient deficiency. 
So then the, the, new, the national authorities need to see how low can this be um, uh, without uh, uh, contributing to nutrient, nutrient um, dependency, deficiency. Reduced consumption, sweets, a limited consumption, red meat, less than 350 grams per week, considerably lower, uh, could be considered due to environmental issues. Processed foods with high amounts of fat, salt, and sugar, a limited consumption. Alcohol, no safe lower limit. Processed meat, as low as possible. White meat is also fairly neutral when it comes to, to health, but poultry is, could be preferentially reduced also <coughs> due to environmental consideration. Then finally, we uh, had a collaboration with Global Burden of Disease to, to, uh, to see uh, what are the contributors to diet-related disease burden in the Nordic and Baltic countries. And in this collaboration, we established that diet low in whole grain is the highest ranked dietary risk factor in all the, in the Nordic and Baltic countries. Diet high in processed meat is second highest risk factor in five of the eight countries. Diet low in fruit is the third highest, and diet high in red meat is the fourth highest risk factor in all the countries combined. Um, second highest in Denmark, third highest in Norway and Sweden. So this gives an indication where policies should be focused on, where you can, where the 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 the, 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 the most effect could be to reduce, reduce disease burdens in the Nordic and Baltic countries. The report was published in June 2023. 20, uh, the digital version that you can find if you, um, if you, um, on, the, on the website of the Nordic Council of Ministers, that is the primary version. A PDF, uh, a digital version can be downloaded, about 400 pages. Um, it was very nice that to see that about 50, more than 50,000 downloads the few first weeks after our publication. So it is spread in many, not it, uh, also in many other countries uh, outside the Nordic and Baltic region. A book will be available uh, this fall. I think already you can take and order the book at the, at the Nordic Council of Minister website. An extended report will be pub are under publishing. It will, co it will contain about 80 background papers. All of them is also published in, in food and nutrition research because we would like to be transparent and open. Uh, they will also be part of the available of the digital version and appended. And they will. Um, and in addition, we will also have a report on the public consultation with also about 2,000 pages that will be available. So now the, the, the national authorities need to implement this into the national regulations. Nutrient regulation recommendations are adapted by several countries already, and they are now working to adopt their framework for healthy and environment-friendly dietary guidelines. And they also need to consider other aspects of sustainability not covered in NNR, such as food production methodology, uh, self-sufficiency, food security, food safety, animal welfare, socio-cultural aspects that is not covered in the sorry, our scientific report. And then finally they need to implement it into national policies to reach the national food-based dietary guidelines. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. And this it is an impressive work. Unfortunately, I don't think we have time for questions because you used up your time. But thank you <laughs> a lot. And it was interesting. And also a donation for Médecins Sans Frontières. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Instead of a little question. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to welcome Professor Agneta Åkesson. Uh, from Institute of Environmental Medicine at Karolinska Institute, who, as you've heard, headed the Systematic Review Center for NNR 2023. And you've also been doing similar work for EFSA, as we heard. And you will share with us the lessons learned for nutritional epidemiology. So, cool. Thank you, Anna, and thank you for the invitation. 
so I will talk about uh, the systematic review that we did for the NNR and especially what we learned. And I also want to highlight that we are quite a minor part of the whole work that Rune told us about uh, just before this. But we were also independent, so we we did work alone. We received we received the systematic reviews that we should perform, but we did not work in collaboration. So we should be kind of separate mm -hmm. from them. And then we were these persons, a, a mix of junior and senior nutrition researchers from the Nordic countries, and basically we. Uh, Learn by doing, hard to say. So we received the following nine topics for systematic reviews. The first uh, four concerns susceptible groups, so like kids or small children, and uh, also groups like pregnant women, lactating women, and so on. And you can see that the exposure concerns protein, fiber, long chain and three fatty acids and B12 intake. <coughs> the next four were more traditional food uh, groups <coughs> in, assessment in asso association with the chronic disease development. <coughs> so it was a substitution of animal with plant protein, legis and pulses, nuts and seed, and white meat. And finally, we had one on uh, dietary fat quality and cognition dementia. So first some general aspects. So preferably we should look for RCTs, but not include trials on weight loss or secondary prevention or malnutrition. And then, as you all know, they were often limited to intermediating risk markers, and then we had to go for that. And of course, it was important to decide how long the intervention was going on. And often we, we choose actually four weeks. And we also had to be aware of co-intervention that often could occur. For the non-intervention, we use only prospective studies like cohorts, nested case control study, or case cohorts. And now just something on, on, on the, the work, on, on what we obtained. So we scrolled like. 172,000 abstracts and uh, five, uh, 756 uh, full text reading and included in the end 226 articles. So that means that three per mil about the abstract you screen were included in the end, but also 8% from uh, of the included articles were found in the reference list and were not captured by the search. So of the in included full text, we did 68 meta-analysis and evaluated strength of evidence for 60 research questions. So the, we followed this strict eight-step process to ensure transparency. And I don't have time to go through them all. Uh, we followed the, the handbook that was already uh, published by the NNR committee. <coughs> Uh, and I will focus a bit on risk of bias assessment here. So we use predominantly <coughs> these three instruments, uh, Rob2, Robin's Eye, and Rob Knobs. And the latter one here is uh, developed by the USDA for coral studies, nutrition studies, and it's based on Robin's Eye. And the tools are strict. Uh, and low risk of bias is the exception, not the rule, and the burden of proof of that lies on the researcher. A few new instruments have been launched after we started. It's NewQuest and Robin's Eye, and there's also the OHAT, uh, which recently we used in, in, in the EFSA evaluation, and it's clear that this OHAT is less strict, I would say, than the Robin's uh, Rob Knobs, for instance. So this is just to show the algorithm for, in this case, randomized parallel uh, trials. And uh, uh, it's a first domain. Uh, and you can see that it's quite, see if this works. 
you can see it's it's quite strict process it's easily to end up in the high risk of bias but of course if you do a good quality study you can end up in low risk of bias but there is also always a risk of ending down to to some concern about the risk of bias and if you look down here you can see the overall sum that we created for the risk of bias based on uh, all the five domains. So to the uh, right here, you can see the overall sum of bias here. And if you look at the arrows here, you can see the lowest error indicates that if you have greens and yellows for some domains, if you have one red, then you're red as a total. And up here, if you have not almost all greens but one yellow, then you end up yellow, which means some concern. But if you have all green, then you're fine. And this example, again, was parallel groups for the nuts and seeds, uh, systematic review. Okay, so now I'll go through a bit summary of the risk of bias. So we performed risk of bias for 83 RCTs and 135 <coughs> Uh, observational studies. And if we stick with the RCT, you can see that high risk of bias were in, in, in one fifth about the studies. While for the observational studies, I would say having low risk is exceptional uh, in this case, but of course we, we have to aim for the yellow part. But high risk of bias was actually uh, observed in uh, or uh, categorized as being high in 41% in, in of, the, of the cohort studies. So what was the reason for high risk of bias? <coughs> and for the RCTs, the second domain, uh, which included lack of blinding, you didn't perform ITT if that was the requirement, you have low comp compliance, like crossover, or if you have a dietary intervention and so on. So this was the most common reason for receiving high risk of bias. And of course, if we look at the dietary intervention, this is, uh, this is the tricky area for, for those studies because of the problems with blinding and so on. But having missing outcome was also quite common. And this is often in contrast to the cohort studies. So what was the reason for high risk of bias in observational mm -hmm. studies? I will move on to the next slide where it's bigger. And here you can see that confounding uh, was the most common reason for, for, not, for having a high risk of bias. And that was either that you had missed key confounders <coughs> or you had low validity, re reliability of, of the ones that you have measured. So there was a serious risk of residual confounding. But also missing data was not that uncommon in observational studies. And this refers exposure <coughs> status, which is in contrast actually to the exposure assessment. Uh, so this means like deviation over, over time or like, you know, bias between groups or something that could occur during follow-up. While high risk of bias was seldom in, in for the outcome. If we instead look at low risk of bias, uh, we see for the RCT that it's quite evenly distributed, the different domains, while if we focus on the observational to the right, you can see that the outcome assessments, as I already said in the last slide, is, is often quite good and is something that often is better in, in the observational studies than in several of the RCTs. And also selection of results uh, is, it was often received uh, a, a low risk of bias. And that was that it there's quite often in supplements published a lot of the results, so it's not like only cherry picking. So that was, but also sometimes missing data was was very uh, was not that much in these studies. So we used to, now as to, I will move to the 
seventh step, which is the strengths of evidence. And here we use the World Cancer Research Foundation's uh, uh, strengths of evidence grading. And I will uh, use these colors in the future the future slides. Uh, and of course, this is not only the risk of bias, but it's a quantity consistency and precision in the body of evidence. And this is the result, the result for the strengths of evidence, convincing quite few and substantial effects also quite few. And if I instead go through the specific SRs that we performed, I will now only focus due to the time restriction focus on where we consider the evidence to be probable or more. So uh, a total protein uh, or uh, animal protein intake when you are below 18 months uh, was uh, probably related to higher, uh, probably evidence in related to higher BMI uh, later in, in, in childhood. While this was not the case for the plant protein, and the similar kind of thing was not the case for plant protein for the weight gain. So this is probably evidence that plant protein will not increase the weight and, and the BMI. And here I added the, the results for the fibers. You can see there was inconclusive. And uh, here is uh, plant protein substituting animal protein. Not so clear, but if we go to the nuts and seeds, there were probable evidence of nuts and seed uh, decreasing the total CBD and the CHD incidence and mortality. <coughs> and for the for the white meat. Substantial effects of white meat on CBD mortality and diabetes type 2 was considered uh, unlikely. And again, inconclusive mainly for the, and also for the RCTs here, where, which was for the long chain fatty acids in pregnancy. And if we go down, we have one green there. So it was quite convincing that uh, higher experimental doses in older B12 deficient subjects led to a higher B12 biomarker, which I guess is really short. <laughs> <laughs> Just some very quick, before I stop, uh, results on the systematic view, review on nuts and seeds. And this is a summary for us plot of meta-analysis. and. Uh, to the right dose uh, response meter. So what else did we learn? Yeah, uh, for, for some of us who were part of the NNR 2012, it was very clear that there was a re low reporting quality in general of the studies. And that inspired the development of strobe nut, which eventually then was published in Cloth Medicine, and an, a bit more explanation also in advances of nutrition in 2017. And I think they are important, these ones. And we concluded it seems like the reporting has improved over time. Yet, of course, we, we have the, the, we started actually the search from the inception of PubMed. So we can't claim that these kind of reporting guidelines help, but there is still a, a report, a, an improved reporting over time. But for the future, it is important to focus on the design, if you have an RCT, I mean, in general, on design and the analytical plan to obtain as low risk of bias as possible. And additionally, we often miss data for the meta-analysis, so it could be good to, to be more extensive on presenting results for, for groups and so on. Moreover, the validation of the exposure was seldom uh, rarely mentioned in the report. And this potential loss to follow-up was not always transparent. For the future NNRs, as we have heard already today, the new method, I think, will be important. Uh, but of course, it, it's, it's, it's a bit for the future to see how that could be incorporated in a systematic review. And also for the Mendelian randomization, there's a lot that has been done that make no sense, so we have a lot to learn there, I think. 
And then finally, like a personal reflection, this was quite heavy uh, workload, uh, but it was rewarding. And especially I think the Nordic collaboration was nice in this polarized world, I would say. And then before I stop, I just want to uh, give an example of another uh, kind of Nordic uh, collaboration that I encountered during a day of this remote. I don't know if Rune thinks it's remote. Moskja say a super remote and a super remote blue foot. <laughs> And it's there. Uh, I spent the day there uh, in an old closed school that, that we could find kind of shelter from the rain, the rain and the cold. And here you can see the classroom. Uh, you can see the fjord outside. And to the left, you can see something that I <laughs> had the <larger. laughs> So this kind of made my day to see a Swedish a school chart on vitamins in a remote Nordic Nor Norwegian school. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Agnetha, for that. And over 70,000 abstracts. <coughs> you were nine people? How many did you read, or how did you divide the work among you on those 70,000 abstracts? Yes, yeah, so we, were, we worked in pairs, and then, uh, so they screened both, and then I came in to Ryan afterwards and see where they disagreed, and then we tried to uh, agree on something. Yeah, that was a lot of abstracts. A lot of abstracts per person for those nine people, huh? Okay. Yeah. Some more questions, comments, Toing Nitta? We have a few minutes. Yes? Yeah. Um, Agnesa, you may also uh, tell that uh, part of the story, at least the EFSA part that you didn't go into details with, but we used AI to screen all these um, uh, abstracts and titles. So there is help out there, you know, for those who want to... Yeah, so for to, the EFSA work, that was something yeah. that uh, came afterwards. Yeah. We did the... What was the name of the program now yet? Priscilla. Hmm. So it was so you worked by yourself and then you had the AI partner yeah. who kind of helped. But you. often the, mm. the, the humans were better than the AI, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Just the last question both to, to Julie and you. Do you see differences between the system used by Sakan and the, the system used here from the point of view? Anything that popped out in your head? Any differences in the methodology for looking at the evidence? Did you see? Did you sense any differences between how we do it in the Nordic countries and what it, I mean, I, I think that um, I think both of the assessments are looking at um, looking at the quality of evidence and also grading the certainty, which is which is good. I think we need mm -hmm. to do both of those aspects. Slightly different tools we use, but I think generally, um, you know, there was a consistency in use of, of, a, of a good tool for that. So I think, although they weren't identical, I think there was a lot of parallels, and the, the way we're looking at the evidence is very similar, mm -hmm. uh, which which is encouraging to see. Okay, thank you, Anita. And I'd like to introduce my former colleague, Eva Varenskjö Lemming from the Swedish Food Agency, but now she works at the Department of Food Studies, Nutrition and Dietetics, and she's also affiliated at the Department of Surgical Sciences, Medical Epidemiology at Uppsala University. And Eva was also part of the, one of the Swedish representatives of the NR committee. Yes. And now she's going to talk about a healthy dietary pattern according to NNR 2023. My presentation, or do I? Thank you so much, Anna Karin. And uh, oh, so uh, I was uh, very delighted to be invited to speak on this topic: a healthy dietary pattern according to the NNR. And uh, I would like to start uh, by showing you this uh, slide. And I guess uh, those of you being here is not unfamiliar with this. 
on uh, the left hand side, uh, we see the many layers of uh, a diet. We have the nutrients, we have bioactive compounds, we have food items, and then the dietary patterns. And this is a picture uh, by my colleague Agneta Andersson. And then on the right hand side, of course, we have uh, our uh, metabolism. It's a schematic uh, representation of the metabolic pathway. So yes, diet is complex the same way as we are complex. And of course, dietary recommendations should account for this. And diet is a very complex exposure to handle in ethics studies. Let me talk a little bit on food synergy, uh, which is the concept linking foods and dietary patterns to health. And it's defined as additive or more than additive influences of foods and foods, food constituents on health. And um, food is complex and its constituents act in concert. And this is what we refer to as the food matrix. And uh, with this, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. So in um, nutritional epidemiology, when studying diet disease associations, food and dietary patterns are important to consider. And effects uh, of foods on disease uh, can be due either to the food matrix or due to uh, the nutrient content independent of uh, the food matrix. And I guess uh, David Jacobs and Linda Tapsom, uh, they are not the only ones that have thought about diet in, in this way. And I wanted to give you this quote, and I was very, I was very happy when I found this. This is from a <laughs> nutrition book from 1911, and it's written by Ingeborg Wallin, and she was a pioneer in home economics teaching. And she's born in 1968, and she was uh, um, active in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And this is what she says. And we don't prepare our foods directly from nutrients, but from foodstuffs, which are mixes occurring in nature that are rich in nutrients and other substances. The latter are important for the food's flavor, since all nutrients except sugar and salt lack flavor. In addition, foodstuffs contain undigestible substances. And I thought it was very neat to, to, to see this, and this is pre-biochemistry. So, this concept can be illustrated like this. Participants in a study, I guess they eat foods, and I don't think they reflect upon which dietary pattern they have. But me, as a researcher, I'm very interested in, in getting hold of their dietary patterns. And, uh, and, I, and I want to relate this to disease risks. And of course, uh, the dietary patterns uh, comprise of different food groups. And the food groups can be dairy products, uh, cereals, or, or uh, vegetables, or whatever. And of course, the food groups are comprised of different food items. And in turn, uh, the food items are comprised of nutrient and other bioactive <laughs> compounds. So we have around 100 nutrients, and then we have a 10 times as more bioactive compounds. So yes, uh, diet is a complex exposure. So, so uh, what uh, uh, I, I wanted to go back to the uh, NNR 2012, the previous edition of the NNR, and and to uh, to uh, what did this uh, edition conclude about foods and dietary patterns in relation to health? Hmm. Oh. hmm. So two uh, reviews uh, were performed. Uh, as part of the NNR 2012 edition. One review was on dietary patterns. It was an explorative uh, review. And the other one was a systematic review uh, on the health effects associated with foods characteristic of the Nordic diet. And uh, the results from these uh, uh, reviews uh, were formulated into the most important dietary changes needed to support energy balance and long-term health. And uh, this is the infographic from the Swedish Food Agency. And uh, it's, uh, it's a Swedish version of uh, the version that was in the NNR. 
and it was built up uh, by the uh, uh, food groups to increase, uh, the food groups to, to change, and also the food groups to, to, uh, to limit. So now to the New Nordic Nutrition Recommendations 2023. I say the blue edition uh, to this edition. So uh, we heard uh, Rune talk about uh, how the recommendations were developed for the 15 food groups. And of course, uh, as Rune said, uh, we considered, first of all, the health effects due to the food matrix. Then we considered the health effects due to nutrient content. And of course, these are the exposures in our studies that we uh, digged into. And then, uh, of course, uh, we uh, looked at public health challenges and burden on disease, as Rune also talked about in his uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we gave priority to chronic disease risks. And as a second uh, or an additional la layer, we considered the environmental effects of uh, the consumption. And uh, this is... Uh, my presentation of uh, the recommendations in the NNR 2023. Uh, I wanted to go more for pictures uh, rather than, than, than uh, uh, writings. So uh, you see what we should eat more of, uh, and then uh, lagom, uh, and then uh, to limit uh, the intake of red and processed meats and processed foods high in uh, salt, fat, sugar, and uh, we should limit the intake of, uh, of alcohol. As uh, I, I used to work at the food, Swedish Food Agency, and I worked with the Dietary Service, so I wanted to uh, put in this slide, which is a representation of the average intake in the Nordic countries of uh, a few food groups uh, considered in the NNR, vegetables, fruits, meat, and nuts, and uh, it's grams per day, and it's the average consumption. And as you see, I have also put in uh, some purple bars, and that's the recommendations in the NNR 2023. And as you see, there is quite a big gap. So there is a lot of uh, things that can be done for uh, making the diets more healthy in the Nord all the Nordic countries. Hmm. When I was asked to give these presentations, I started taking photos of my own uh, plates. And then I reflected that mm, it's, you know, it's, it's complex. And, and uh, when participants in, in studies are asked to give you know, uh, uh, information about what they eat, it's, it's, it's a delicate task. Uh, but I guess we, we need to know what people eat because we are interested in studying diet disease associations. So now I would like uh, to talk a little bit about how to go from usual diet uh, to dietary patterns and associations to health outcomes. So our participants have to, uh, or I as a researcher, I want information about uh, the diets of, of, of the participants. And we have different dietary assessment methods to use. Um, classically, in a prospective cohort studies, we would have an FFQ. <coughs> but now, uh, with uh, new technology, it is possible to get more detailed data uh, via uh, web-based methods. And on the right side of the slide, uh, I have both the ASA24, which is the automated self-administered 24-hour dietary assessment tool used in NHANES, the American Dietary Surveys. And then on the lower, um, on the lower, it's the uh, Dixmott and Flex uh, diet, which is the method used by the Swedish Food Agency in their dietary survey. And uh, uh, the 24-hour recall method gives detailed information on, on, on the diet. That's good. Then, as a researcher, I get a lot of data <laughs> that I have to organize and I have to generate uh, the dietary patterns that I'm interested in studying. 
So this is just an example of, of some diet data. You see fruits and vegetables and red meat and so forth. And in order to go from the usual data or from the usual consumption that my participants have given me to come to dietary patterns, I need to create or generate dietary patterns in, in some way. And in principle, there are two ways of generating uh, dietary patterns in the population. And one is the a priori dietary patterns, or referred to as the dietary indices or scores. And when we, when we generate these, uh, we use what we know is healthy. And this can be used to study adherence to dietary guidelines, for example. Uh, in the literature, there are plenty, plenty of different dietary scores. We have the healthy eating index or the alternative healthy eating index, which is, uh, the, um, which is uh, adherence to the American dietary guidelines. And actually, uh, they do uh, measure the adherence of the American population to these scores. And uh, the total score has a maximum of 100 points. And as you see, uh, they are not, they have a, a long way to go to, to go to a healthy diet. Uh, but then we have the Mediterranean diet score, which is very common. Uh, there are plenty of different uh, Mediterranean diet scores, the DASH score, and also, of course, we have Nordic diet scores, like the Healthy Food Index. So um, I have my data. Um, I have the usual consumption of the participants. Uh, I have uh, food intake, I have nutrient intake, or both, uh, that I can use in order to generate one of these uh, indexes or, or scores. And, and uh, of course, uh, in order to get to the score that I will use in my analysis, I need to, to uh, group my data into food groups. And this is just an example from a, a modified Mediterranean diet score uh, that uh, you see have a lot of different food groups, fruits and vegetables, legumes, fish, etc. And, and also some of the scoring, uh, or we use different scoring techniques uh, in, in different indices. And, and, and I guess it's, uh, that's one of the uh, tricky parts when comparing uh, results. But anyway, uh, you can use both uh, positive and uh, negative scorings, uh, meaning that healthy food uh, items will have uh, the, the higher the intake, the higher the point, while, for example, with red and processed meat, you will have the higher the intake, the lower the point. And all participants will have a score point, and the higher the score, the more adherent the participant is to this particular score. And I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about uh, one uh, study that has used a dietary index, and it's the Swedish Healthy Eating Index, <coughs> Sheja. And this is based on the 2015 dietary, Swedish dietary guidelines. And it is studying all-cause mortality. And it's recently published. And it was around 100,000 men, aged 35 to 65, in Västerbotten. And they were followed up for about 15 years. And 2,000 women and 4,000 men died. And uh, you can see the scoring, uh, both uh, positive scoring or positive components and negative components in, in this uh, score. And of course, uh, the Swedish Dietary Guidelines from 2015 is based on the MNR 2012. And the results, as you see, uh, in quant quintile 5 versus quintile 1, uh, there was an inverse association between uh, adherence to this uh, Shea score and all-cause mortality. It was a bit stronger for women than in men. And uh, also in this study, they looked at uh, the association between adherence to the, these uh, guidelines and uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And they also saw that a lower estimated dietary greenhouse gas emission uh, was seen uh, with higher Shea scores. And of course, these results indicate that a higher adherence to dietary guidelines is beneficial for both longevity and climate sustainability. Going back to how to derive dietary patterns, 
Uh, and the other principal method is the data-driven uh, dietary pattern. And this, uh, of course, gives information about the diet in the population. I'm not using any of my knowledge uh, that I have before. And uh, typically, uh, we, will, uh, we will form uh, or generate a healthy dietary pattern or a prudent dietary pattern, and a Western and a, or a traditional dietary pattern. And, and um, although uh, you can't directly compare these uh, a posterior dietary patterns between populations, we see quite consistent results. Uh, um, and we find, you know, the healthy dietary pattern often. So, in this case, we use a data reduction technique or a principal component analysis or a factor analysis in order to derive our dietary patterns. Once again, I have my usual consumption data from, from my FFQ in the participants. I use the frequency of consumption or intake in grams per day and I collapse the data. Maybe I have around 100 food items from the beginning. I collapse the data into around 30 to 35 food groups, and then I enter these food groups into the statistical method. And then I get out my uh, dietary patterns, which are continuous variables that I can use in my an analysis. And uh, uh, the points, or the, you see the 0.455 and, and so forth, uh, those, uh, those are uh, component loadings, and these can be seen as um, uh, correlations between the food group and the corresponding dietary pattern. So in this healthy uh, diet score or uh, dietary pattern, you see high influence of vegetables, fruits, and, and nuts and seeds, for example. And the study that I wanted to talk about in this case is uh, one of my studies where I have used a long-term a posteriori dietary pattern and the risk of hip fractures. And long-term meaning that we have updated the information once during follow-up. So we followed up 57,000 women uh, taking part of the Swedish mammography cohort. And from 31 food groups, we formed two dietary patterns, the healthy and the Western dietary pattern. And as you see, we saw that there was an inverse association uh, between, um, this is in, in, in uh, the higher uh, quartiles, uh, and uh, inverse association to hip fractures with a healthy dietary pattern, while there was a direct association uh, with, uh, between the Western dietary pattern and uh, hip fracture. And uh, these results suggest that eating a healthy, a uh, varied diet is beneficial for the prevention of fragility fractures in women. Hmm. So, what did the NNR 2023 conclude? conclude uh, and, and there is a background uh, paper uh, by Henne, Henna Webselainen and uh, Jana Lindström that will be published uh, later this fall or early next spring. And uh, they concluded, uh, or NNR concluded, that healthy dietary patterns associate with a reduced risk of CVD, type 2 diabetes, obesity, cancer, bone health, and premature death. And uh, what should a health, or what should a, a healthy dietary <coughs> pattern uh, contain? Um, high intakes of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, fish, low-fat dairy, legumes. And it should be low in red and processed meat, sugar sweetened beverages, sugary foods, and refined uh, grains. And this, I guess, go hand in hand uh, with the recommendations on the food groups in uh, the MNR 2023. So uh, I also uh, wanted to uh, spend some time on the 2020 update of the dietary guidelines for Americans because this was. Uh, important uh, qualified systematic reviews that were part of the background review uh, that was written in the NNR project. And in uh, this um, update of the American Guidance for Americans, there were systematic reviews carried out between dietary patterns and, and body composition and uh, overweight <coughs> and obesity, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, cancer, bone health, neurocognitive function, 
sarcopenia and all cause mortality. And uh, I guess uh, the, the, the conclusions supported uh, what the MNR concluded, of course, since this was part of the, uh, uh, part, part of the evidence. Uh, but I uh, wanted uh, to just mention this uh, as is uh, one of the uh, reviews uh, performed uh, because uh, one of the studies that was part of this uh, uh, systematic review and, and, uh, and, and it's the relationship between dietary patterns and, cons uh, dietary patterns and bone health and, and uh, uh, the study that I talked about uh, was part of this, uh, this uh, review. Uh, so they actually updated a previous review conducted by the 2015 committee. And uh, they looked upon the evidence in adults, adolescents, and children over, uh, above the age of two. And uh, they included <laughs> nine studies, uh, seven in adults and two in uh, children and adolescents. And they concluded that there was not enough evidence to draw any conclusions in children and adolescents. However, in adults, uh, they concluded this. So uh, they said uh, that a higher adherence to healthy dietary patterns were beneficially associated with bone health in most studies. And the healthy diets were characterized by high intakes of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, fish, low-fat dairy, and legumes, and low in red and processed meats, sugar-sweetened beverages, sugary foods, and refined uh, grains. Once again, uh, hand in hand uh, with uh, the recommendations in the MNR 2023. And in this review, uh, they also uh, um, identified weaknesses with the studies, uh, like missing confounders, not updated information on diet, or incomplete data, for example. And the conclusion, uh, the 2020 committee updated and strengthened the conclusion drawn by the 2015 committee. And the grade uh, was moderate, so strong evidence for the association between healthy dietary patterns and bone health. And uh, this is just from the table in the systematic review. And um, I, I just thought it was pretty interesting to read this because uh, these limitations here, um, since I have written the study, I see that they might not have uh, read the study uh, very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> because some of those I think we did. But anyway, uh, I guess it, it's, it, it's just interesting, I think. Uh, for example, uh, we, we actually updated uh, the diet, but they say we only assess diet once at baseline. So, conclusions. Adherence to a healthy dietary pattern is associated with a reduced risk of chronic disease. And the results from uh, studies with dietary patterns and food groups go hand in hand. And I would conclude that a dietary pattern, according to the MNR, is good for our health. Any questions for Eva? Yes, Lisa. Uh, I'm, I'm Trisha. I'm a postdoc in the Royal Medical Medicine Institute and uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And this is, I had a question for Runa actually, but because you also mentioned it in your presentation, um, I wanted to ask you about the environmental components that you considered for NNR. Um, and from my perspective, because I work with like looking at what a sustainable diet is. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit concerned when I see that, for me, 350 grams, even if it's a limit, it's considerably high if we look at what the carbon budget would be for an entire diet. Um, if, and like, consuming, let's say that I would consume 349 grams, that would be more than the carbon budget that I have for a diet in order to protect the planet. Um, and so I feel like it, it's a little bit could be, now I'm very critical, a bit misleading to kind of say that it's been considered and that these recommendations are both healthy and environmentally friendly. And then, um, yeah, I was just wondering 
what the thoughts are on that and what the discussions were. Because I, I understand it's problematic um, because there are a lot of things to consider. So I just wanted to know what the discussions were. Uh, the, the co I think I didn't say that, but I think Rune talked about it, that all the quantitative uh, recommendations are based on health. Uh, and and uh, with the red and uh, processed meat, we say that uh, for environmental uh, reasons, it should be considerable lower. Yeah. But uh, you can uh, yeah. you can fill so in. That is exactly what we say. Okay. Maximum 350 based on health, but we advise the, all the national authorities in those eight countries to consider lower amounts due to environmental issues. But that is a, that is a sort of political pri priorities. Yeah in the different countries. Although, although wondering, because it's, if you're looking at nutrients and the recommended intakes, and I know that, for example, red meat is an important source of, for example, iron, which is, um, lots of people have deficiencies in that. Um, and I was wondering if you ever discussed looking into, okay, so for both environmental and sort of not health, but like nutrient re nutritional reasons, this could be like the lower limit, if there's like a lower limit, so people know that, okay, if I want to have a diet, it's actually, like, it's good for me, I'm going to be healthy, but I will also protect the environment. So that, that's more specific, mm. because I think that just lower <clears throat> can be a yeah. bit diffuse and yeah. abstract. I, I think that's an interesting task for the national authorities, okay. because the diet in Estonia yeah. is different from the diet in Iceland sure. or in Norway. Mm -hmm. So there you need to have the, the local national diet, nutrient intake, and then you can do those considerations and give and the, and the and priorities. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. But strictly speaking, there is also no clear health reason to say that 350 grams of red meat are safe, right? Um, there is also, due to this meta-analysis, there, there is also an, an increased risk with lower amounts. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, the, so, so there, are, there are two different issues here. Mm -hmm. And we would really not like to increase the, the level of iron deficiency in the Nordic countries, mm -hmm. which is serious for some groups. So, so there is a balance here and there is no absolute right, correct answer. So and this is what we try to, to convey, mm -hmm. and also for, for the national authorities to build <coughs> and develop the national guidelines. Yes, because that was also mentioned that you consider like the different life stages and also uh, sex differences and, and the prevalence of iron deficiency is very different uh, exactly. in, in different populations. Right? Exactly. So how is that communicated? So that is what we, we are trying to communicate to all of this. And yeah. of course, um, typically you have one to dietary guideline for a healthy general, for the general population. You could develop specific dietary guidelines for young females or females or older men or whatever. Yeah. But uh, typically we have general guidelines for for, for adults, and then of course you need to take into account that we are different. Some older people eat very little and have less energy intake, so you need to, to do those adjustments. So I would also encourage you not to be too strict about our quantitative limits. It's, it's a way of coming by, it's, it's, it's much better than just saying increase or decrease but you should be not not too focused on the exact values. Uh, they are the best estimates and to, to convey the, 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 the evidence that's behind the, the, the guidelines. Any question for Eva? Moving back to the dietary patterns, or is it crystal, crystal clear? clear. <laughs> I have a question, what about there are so many different healthy dietary indexes. Yeah. What, what, how should you think? What is a good index and what is not? You, you mean the, the, the Mediterranean uh, diet? Yeah, what, uh, I mean, score, we're going the, through the all the these studies. Was it, 
or is what what's what is the challenges when going through all these studies with diff all the different types of ways of or do you think the message has got to come across regardless of how you do it I think so, uh, because uh, the, the, the study results go in the same direction. Uh, and, and I guess it's all these different healthy food indices uh, will, will include different components, different food items, uh, but they mirror you know, the total uh, healthy dietary pattern in, in that uh, particular person. So I guess uh, we will see some uh, different associations but I think they, 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 they show, they go in the same direction and, mm. and, and they support each other that a healthy dietary pattern is beneficial for different disease outcomes. And, and I know, for example, in the Swedish mammography cohort, we have, I, I have looked at uh, correlations between like the modified Mediterranean diet score and the healthy uh, dietary pattern. And it has a, a correlation of, I, I think, 0.5 or 0.6. So they are quite correlated, but they don't, uh, they don't uh, mirror all the same things, but supporting each other. Okay, thank you, Eva. Oh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Inge Tettens, Department of Nutrition, Exercise and Sports at the University of Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, and you served as a member of the Working Group for NNR 2012, and you also chaired the expert group on the scientific evidence supporting the Danish food-based dietary guidelines the same year. And you are a member of the EFSA nutrition panel that published a scientific opinion on establishing food-based dietary guidelines. So you're really an expert on this area. And you will tell us about the, as I can say, art and science of moving from the nutrition recommendations to food-based dietary guidelines. So please. Thank you very much for this introduction. And also thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. This is one of my favorite topics, how to move from nutrition recommendations to food-based dietary guidelines. So I hope that um, I can inspire uh, to some of the future work now when we have the NNR 2023, and there's still a lot of work to do in that regard. Well, when we talk food-based dietary guidelines, I think it's always good to go back to FAO, who has made a very nice description uh, of food-based dietary guidelines, that they are the basis, really, a lot of policies in the area of nutrition and, and foods, in the area of um, uh, agricultural policies and health policies, and also uh, nutrition education programs. But also they provide advice to the general population uh, on a dietary pattern that can provide the nutrients that we require, and also um, on um, uh, a diet that can promote uh, general health and prevent diseases. So I think Having that said, you know, we are start to dig into what food-based dietary guidelines are really all about. And I think here it is good to start with the International Con Conference on Nutrition back in Rome in 1992. I don't know if any of the, from the audience uh, was present at that time. Yes, there is one. <laughs> and uh, maybe, I hope you can agree with me that that was actually a very crucial point to the area of global nutrition, you know, as addressing some of the critical issues, some of the critical issues that in order for all the knowledge to be transferred into <coughs> actions, you know, we need uh, agreement, we need commitments from politicians, not the least, and we need uh, commitments at all levels, including national level. But also at this, um, uh, as part of the plan of action uh, for nutrition that was, uh, that was agreed about, it was also agreed that food-based dietary guidelines, they should be available in all countries. So the international um, organizations, they take their time, they need time, we all need time you know, to do a thorough job. And the experts, um, it took about six years uh, until we got the next report from FAO, WHO, 
on the preparation and use of food-based dietary guidelines. And even though it's, a, it's an old report from 1998, it's still worth uh, looking at because it contains a lot of the key issues that we're still uh, discussing. Um, it dwelled on and described the rationale for having food-based dietary guidelines and some of the scientific considerations that are important. You know, all the, the various uh, scientific areas that should be included in the considerations and not the least that we should have scientific evidence behind any uh, dietary guidelines. Um, also, they emphasized already in 1998, just what Eva said, the importance of dietary patterns that it is more than food, um, it is more than nutrients, it's food and it's dietary patterns. So that's uh, almost old knowledge, but it's good to be reminded. And they actually also put forward a suggestion for a stepwise pro process for developing food-based uh, dietary guidelines, you know, how important it is to have cross-disciplinary work around the table, you should not only have nutritionists or health people, but actually uh, people with different uh, back scientific backgrounds. How important it is to do a thorough review of the uh, relationships that we know from the literature, um, to review the dietary patterns, to draft the food-based dietary guidelines, how important it is to go for a hearing and to um, pay attention to the wording and that this wording should be tested also among con consumer groups. I mean, all uh, issue or, or points that you may say, well, this is almost obvious, but actually when you look at the actual processes behind the development of food-based dietary guidelines, you know, it, it's nice to see that this was written already in 98. But also they stressed that the food-based dietary guidelines could not be um, you know, for all countries, but they should be um, constructed for uh, each individual country. In 2012, uh, 10, so that means 12 years later, um, I was part of the EFSA uh, panel on nutrition, and uh, we were commissioned by uh, the EU Commission to put forward a scientific opinion on how to establish food-based dietary guidelines in the EU countries. So we looked at the old report and still a lot of the same general principles were um, came true. And I think that one thing that we actually outlined or put through as very important was that the outcome should not only relate uh, to you know agriculture, food production, um, food intake and health, but also that we should include social uh, factors, economic factors, uh, agricultural and also environmental factors. So this was in 2010. Now the world is moving and at that time 2011 uh, in Norway the uh, nutrition um, uh, the National uh, Council for Nutrition, with Rune Bromhoff as uh, the chair, had just been through a review of the evidence related uh, food intake and uh, nutrition and health, and they launched this uh, report in 2011. At the same time, in Denmark, there was also a pressure uh, from the government, you know, to to update the then um, food-based dietary guidelines in Denmark. So I was chairing the um, working group uh, on the evidence base for the Danish update of the dietary guidelines. The specific thing about the work from Norway is that it took the spe a specific uh, systematic approach. And I mean, at that time, and we're only talking about 10 to 15 years ago, maybe 20, right? But uh, with the systematic approaches um, coming forward, and you know, we had to, as, as was said by Agneta, we learned by doing, right? Doing a systematic review, getting all the literature that is out there, uh, getting it all together in a consistent way, using uh, the World Cancer re uh, Research Report and the way of making an evidence matrix. matrix. So we all learned from Denmark, we, we um, uh, got the outcome from Norway and we updated that again. And we ended up with a set of dietary, official dietary guidelines in 2013. And it's interesting to think of, this is only 10 years ago. At that time, we in the expert group in Denmark, we were asked specifically if there were any other uh, kind of uh, factors 
or dimensions that should be considered when formulating and updating the food-based dietary guidelines. And we considered the environmental factors. Um, remember, I'd, always been, I'd, I'd already been part of the EFSA uh, group, so I knew what we wrote in that scientific opinion. But actually, we decided and concluded that it was too premature in 2013 to take environmental factors into consideration for in the update of the Danish food-based dietary guidelines, simply because the data were not sufficiently there and there was a lot of uncertainties about how to do that and we didn't have um, the guts, I guess, also to move ahead. So we were uh, waiting for something to happen, some, someone to go forward. And actually, um, that happened almost two years later when I was also part of the NNR working group or committee, as we call it today, where we actually included a chapter on sustainable food consumption and some of the environmental issues. So it was being uh, highlighted again and again how uh, the meat and fish with low environmental um, should be included in lower amounts, you know, for environmental uh, reasons and so forth. And that was actually the, the <coughs> issue of the Nordic Nutrition Recommendation where we also use the traffic lights here, the green, the yellow and red that we've already seen now. And a very instrumental um, tool, I think, you know, to illustrate in a nice way without too many words of how could the diet beneficially be changed to something that is more healthy for um, the general population. And at least two years later, or was it only one year later, I think this was from 2015, when the food agency here in Sweden um, launched their food base, or updated their food-based dietary guidelines, also, again, with the traffic lights um, in included. At the same time, um, things were moving ahead at the European level. And here we have the Federation of the European Nutritional Sciences, where we had a new presidency uh, from 2016 uh, to 19, who wanted to put focus on the food-based dietary guidelines with a vision to try to harmonize and try to support each other in developing these uh, food-based dietary guidelines that we knew already from a way back, or, or this was always also established already in the 90s, that it should be individualized into, into each country. <coughs> so a number of meetings were held uh, at the European level. We had a meeting in Brussels in 2017 on the integration of various factors. And the president's vision at that time was that, you know, really to put forward um, that it was no longer single foods, it was no longer just the nutrients, but it should be food groups, it should be food patterns, and how we could integrate some of the um, different factors uh, with, you know, as, as mentioned here in the blue circles. So again, um, with the traffic light as there as a kind of a, a line of direction. That meeting was followed by another meeting we had in Copenhagen in 2018, where we discussed more specifically what kind of dimensions, I mean, we could say that food is everything and all dimensions should be there, but if we wanted to prioritize these dimensions that should be included in the future food-based dietary guidelines, which dimensions should be there and how to do that. The dimensions that, the one dimension that we could all agree about was the sustainability, right? The environmental factors. Um, so we actually um, suggested that from now on, we, in, this was 2018, we should not call it food-based dietary guideline, guidelines, but sustainable food-based dietary guidelines. And we, we actually wrote a paper that was published in uh, the British New, uh, Journal of Nutrition uh, on that. Um, other dimension that we agreed should be addressed in future in the future work should be the social dimension, cultural dimensions, ethical and economic uh, dimensions, um, not the least. But of course, I mean, one thing is to meet at a, have a, an agreement at a meeting, how to do that in practice. So the last of these 
series of meetings in the Fe in defense task force was held the year after in Berlin, where it was a lot of um, it was a lot of discussions about which mathematical approaches could be used in setting or developing the food-based dietary guidelines. And here, um, the mathematical optimization programs were uh, suggested as one suitable tool for in the formulation and quantification of food-based dietary guidelines. But it was also um, agreed that there was really at that time, this was in 2019, a lack of evidence uh, for the extent to which constraints and weights to the different uh, dimensions uh, should be given. And also, um, as I said just before, it was concluded that the mathematical optimization programs, uh, like the linear programming that we have an exa example of here uh, to the right, um, is that that could be both at the population uh, level, but also at individual levels. That um, the summary uh, from that uh, meeting in Berlin was also published uh, just a couple of years, also in the British Journal of Nutrition. Mm -hmm. And I think that the conclusion from this task force uh, was, uh, was also introduced at the last FENCE conference, which was in Dublin in 2019. I don't know if, I don't think that this is on the, on the agenda for the FENCE conference, which is going on these days in Bel Belgrade. But I think coming back to this um, mathematical approach and the, to, to the optimization uh, program that was suggested, I think um, it pay, we, pay, we should pay a tribute to Nicole Damon from INRA, from France. She was really very instrumental in putting forward the, the use and the application of op, uh, li linear optimization uh, in relation to sustainable mm -hmm. diets. And this is um, a presentation she had she gave a couple of years ago in Copenhagen, where she very nicely illustrated, almost it looks very easy, you know, if you consider a sustainable <coughs> diet, if you want to optimize that, you have to consider four individual dimensions, health and nutrition, environment, economy, and culture. So it almost sounds very, very easy, but it's not, it's a little bit complicated now and then. But it is, um, we're getting more and more experience and I think it's fair to say that uh, in France, as we just saw, um, and Nicole is from France, and her approach was actually used in the update uh, of the food-based dietary guidelines in France in 2016. Later in the Dutch um, community or uh, National uh, Nutrition Council, they also used the optimization program to develop the Wheel 5. As uh, we know, their dietary guidelines are um, at the at, at the moment, and um, I think so. Coming back to some of the dimensions, some of the other dimensions that we discussed at the Copenhagen meeting, we discussed the cultural aspects of of uh, food-based dietary guideline. How important it is to include that, and at that meeting, we were all very excited to have a speaker. Um, informing us about the development in Brazil, um, all the way to Brazil that got the, their uh, recent or their latest food-based dietary guidelines updated in 2013, where they actually included the social dimensions, you know, the, the togetherness about um, preparing meals, uh, eating together. Um, so I guess they were, they were uh, very unique at that time, 10 years ago. And since then, I think social dimensions of um, eating and uh, as part of the food-based dietary guidelines has been um, accepted as being a very important part of as one of the dimensions to be included. Um, at the same time, what was also new at that time and um, the Brazilian food-based dietary guidelines was the focus on uh, processed foods or highly processed foods. And I think we could have a separate seminar just talking about the different indexes on all these highly processed foods, how valid or how maybe lack of validation uh, to other, other um, dietary patterns around the world. Um, 
in Denmark, we were also, I was also um, with my group um, considering the kind of guidance on how to formulate your food-based dietary guidelines. If people don't, if the target group of our guidelines don't understand them, can't relate those guidelines to their daily lives, you know, it becomes very difficult, difficult to change anything. So we set up this study on substitution uh, dietary guidelines in Denmark, which um, I'd like to, to share with you. It was a six-month single-blinded parallel RCTs uh, with um, adults uh, uh, around mid mid -age, middle-aged um, adults with at least one risk factor for um, ischemic heart disease. So they were uh, two thirds of them were of the participants were were overweight or obese. And the simple thing we did was to test um, the Danish official dietary guidelines. Those were the ones that I just shared just a few minutes ago. That was the 10 dietary guidelines that were launched in 2013. Who can remember 10 dietary guidelines? And maybe they're not all relevant. So what we did was to formulate five specific substitution guidelines to our participants in the green group, in the substitution dietary gui guideline group. So they were specific to their um, kind of health status. You know, we were specific about meat, exchange meat with fish, um, exchange your refined uh, whole, the grain to whole grain, uh, exchange the uh, sugar and, and sweets to fruit and, and so forth. So only five uh, diet specific uh, targeted um, substitution uh, dietary guidelines. And the results showed after six months that the substitution group, they had a greater dietary favor changes compared with the habitual um, diet and, and also compared with the official with the group that uh, received the official dietary guidelines. That was just the 10 of them, and then you know they could pick anyone or none. But it turned out that after 12 months, we had an intervention, which was dietary guidelines, specific, and recipes. And after 12 months, it seemed that the substitution dietary guideline group and the official dietary guideline group, they had managed in changing their diets uh, favorably to, to the same degree of um, uh, in, a, in a more favorable uh, direction. So that was a few words about the issue about um, how to formulate your dietary guidelines. Of course, talking uh, food-based dietary guidelines, we had the big game changer in 2019 with the Lancet reference diet, Walter Windelt and the group that uh, provided these very, very colorful new reference diet at the global level and then it's soon when we looked at the quantitative um, messages you know it all sounded very different and very different from the dietary patterns uh, that we know from the Nordic countries at least but I guess this was a, 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 a goal and a game changer that where dietary um, gui guidelines and the environmental um, uh, sustainability uh, were included in a common win-win situa situation. In Denmark, we moved fast. Um, I shouldn't say we because I was not part of that. I had moved to the University of Copenhagen in, the, in between. But we had the food-based dietary guidelines where we looked at only the health, uh, health aspects about the food and um, nutrient intake. Um, and then um, some of my former colleagues at the Technical University, they looked at the greenhouse gas emissions and included that um, uh, as a basic uh, advice to the uh, Food Authority, who then launched in 2021 in the middle of the corona situation. We were all online to hear how, the, how these uh, climate-friendly and healthy food-based dietary guidelines uh, look like. And they have been um, presented. They have been presented in several ways. This is the the the, the original way with individual <coughs> foods, very plant-rich uh, diet, uh, but still room for uh, animal products. 
And of course, I'm not going to spend much time on the food based on the Nordic Nutrition Recommendation 2023. I couldn't say um, anything better than has been said already, how the food based dietary guideline in general terms were included as uh, something um, new, as a new add on to the Nordic Nutrition Recommendations that we've had for many, many years. I think I'd like to um, uh, end up with, uh, in, um, with the story about how we are actually trying to optimize uh, the habitual diet in, with a wish to include all of these dimensions <coughs> that we can, um, that we have included, that we have concluded should be included in the food-based dietary guideline. So it's only, not only healthiness, it's not only uh, the nutrient uh, requirements that should be fulfilled, it's also uh, the environmental friendliness and the cultural acceptability. So actually this means that we should know sufficient about uh, the, diet, the current dietary intake, the monitoring of dietary, dietary intake and the importance of that also in the Nordic countries is tremendous. So we have been working using the linear uh, optimizing um, approach to try to provide um, an example of a climate friendly uh, diet. So with the provision that we should have good dietary data, we borrowed data from Germany. We were not able to get uh, to, to have access to the Danish data. So we played with the German uh, data. And uh, what is important here in this slide is all the inputs that are needed and not only the available food items and their nutrition composition, but also the price of each of these foods, the greenhouse gas emission per, per, per food, um, kilogram of food, and then, of course, the observation uh, of the, and the consumption of these foods. So the constraints that we put into our model system was the greenhouse gas emission, uh, which we put to a certain amount, six, 1,615 grams of CO2, equivalents per, per day. Uh, this is the recommended value uh, that, is set, that was set from the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. And then we had also a constraint saying, well, we don't want a, a, a new food-based dietary guidelines that deviates too much from what people are used to eating. Because our experience uh, <coughs> is that then nobody would, would listen. So that was, this is where we put the constraints. And the findings, uh, we have just been published uh, recently in this climate-friendly, health-promoting, and cultural accept acceptable diet for the German adults. And the uh, image here illustrates the changes, the relative changes that are needed, you know, to um, to to end up with this climate-friendly diet. And you'll see that the biggest relative changes from the observed diet, that was the starting point from what adults in Germany were consuming, is really the, uh, the, the change, the increases in fruit and vegetables and other plant-based plant, plant -based, uh, food items. And it's, it also appears that we have the, um, the meat and the animal uh, products, but the relative changes are not that uh, big. We were actually surprised that uh, the actual changes were uh, were not that big, and then so now there is one minute left. So I'll just conclude that the future challenges for establishing these sustainable food-based food-based dietary guidelines is that our starting point is that we do understand the impact of different diets uh, in the development of um, non-communicable diseases. We can provide adequate scientific evidence, and we've heard a lot about that today, to justify the dietary. Uh, guidelines, but we know too little about the effectiveness of different intervention strategies. So, the help take maybe I should just leave the take home messages here that the basic principles they've been there for a long time. The integration of sustainability is widely acknowledged, um, and the advancement, the advancement of multi dimensional sustainable food based dietary guidelines lies in the application of mathematical modeling and harmonization of approaches across countries. So thank you to my colleagues and collaborators on all the, these 
um, issues along the way. Thank you. So, one or two quick questions to Inge. Yes, could yeah. you say who you are? Yeah, uh, my name is Lisa, I work for Swedish Meat. Uh, you talked about uh, sustainable diets, uh, and that's a very complex area with a lot of parameters to consider. And what are your thoughts about, um, uh, today we have already talked about like climate and, and health, but there's a lot of other parameters. What do you think about uh, that? What are your thoughts about how should we combine this or what is needed to uh, talk about all of those parameters at the same time to get a sustainable diet? Well, I think, you know, um, as I've tried to illustrate that it is possible now to combine the, the knowledge that we have. So this way, you know, theoretically, we can move ahead. What the big challenge is, as I showed on the last um, slide is that how do we actually get everyone to move in the same direction? Well, first of all, we have to acknowledge that nobody starts in the same in the same spot, and nobody has um, maybe the same um, goal. So, I mean, it also depends on on the individual. But today, we are talking about official dietary guidelines. We're talking about you know the the general population, whoever that is. Uh, so we, we are talking uh, in general terms. But I think that the tools that we have there, the access to data, the share, the possibilities with sharing the data and the knowledge and also the approaches. I mean, that's why we're here. That's why we're trying to share. You know, this is the only way forward. And I'm not saying that we should stop with making models for the general population as one population. I was talking country-wise. I mean, we could go into specific groups, age groups that has been suggested already, but we could also go into specific subgroups that have specific dietary patterns that Eva talked about that we realize are there. So someone has to move more than others. We may also start with at-risk groups. So there's plenty of work to do. We could even end up with individual advice using some of these approaches. I guess that would be the future for research to actually um, sustain that that was, would, would be possible. Okay, thank you very much. I think we'll have to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and we are soon approaching the end of this meeting, but before we end the meeting, I would like to give the word to our general director at the Swedish Food Agency. So I will try to wrap up this impressive seminar today. I'm very proud that the Swedish Food Agency have arranged this seminar together with the Swedish National Committee for Nutrition and Food Sciences at the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. It's not the first time that we together uh, arranged a, a scientific seminar like this to discuss the findings and applications of an NNR update. It's actually a tradition that we together take this responsibility to spread the knowledge about progress and challenges in nutrition epidemiology as a basis for policy making. And this time, I think it's more important than, and relevant than ever that we do these kind of, of seminars. This update of the NNR has caused more debate, discussion and even criticism than previous editions. Not so much among researchers, but among groups that previously have shown very little interest in nutrition recommendations. I think this is a result of, of many things. Of course, the broadened scope of NNR with more food-based <coughs> recommendations and also the inclusion of en environmental aspects. Also that the food system as a whole is higher up on the political agenda nowadays than, than it has been before because of climate changes and food security reasons. And of course, also, that parts of the food sector is struggling with profitability. All this, I think, has contributed to this debate. 
And therefore, it's even more important that we continue to do, re to do research in nutrition and also that we continue to develop the methodology in, in nutrition research and also for the assessment of all the research. Good research, more knowledge and independent researchers are more important than ever in this sometimes <coughs> very ignorant and populistic climate that we have at the moment in this society. So, to summarize this day, first this afternoon we heard from Professor Julie Lagro about the large effort needed to collect and evaluate data as a basis for policy making. Uh, the insights from UK shows us that this is a common challenge in, in many countries. Next, we heard from Dr. Xavier Garcia de Alvenis, talked about the, way, the new ways to use epidemiological data using the target trial emulation framework. <laughs> A bit hard to follow and very new to me, but very interesting. So this impulse helps us to put the, the Nordic work in, into new perspective, and that's interesting, I think. Uh, the scope of the NNR is increased for every update, and as I just mentioned, in, in this update, the newly added food-based guidelines and the environmental perspective was added and has been the center of, of attention. But today, we could focus on the evidence from the nutritional science that is still the basis for the NNR. The methodology of NNR 2023 is impressive, and we heard from Professor Rune Blumhoff that despite the widened scope with environmental perspective, the project still managed to update the methodology behind the data collection, the evaluation of data, uh, uh, the evaluation of the evidence, which is core, the core part of NNR, the, the, the core part of NNR, which is the, still the, the nutrient recommendations and also to develop a protocol for making science advice on, on food groups. As part of this methodology, a separate center for system, systematic reviews was set up, and we heard from Professor Agneta Åkesson about the experiences of such a center and also the development of the methodology. I think that is a very good example when we, the Nordic countries, come together uh, and do things and achieve things that would actually be impossible or very difficult for a single Nordic country to, to do. This thorough methodology and the good work of many, many experts uh, in the Nordic and Baltic countries means that we can rely on NNR providing us with the latest and most comprehensive update on nutrient recommendations and what is a healthy diet. The outcome of the NNR is to a large extent the same healthy diet that we have known for many years. But the evidence for the relationship between the diet and the risk for chronic disease is increasing. And Dr. Eva Warenskjö-Lemming presented this healthy dietary pattern. And that is a solid ground now for policy for improved public health. So we as policymakers, we now have a responsibility to use these recommendations. There is an urgent need to improve dietary habits and achieve a food consumption that uh, is of benefit for both human health and the planet. It is still a challenge though how to translate scientific evidence into food-based dietary guidelines and Professor Inge Tetens walked us through some of these challenges and the process of making food-based dietary guidelines differ between the Nordic countries and between different countries and I'm pleased to hear about the efforts to collaborate in, in Europe and how we can learn from each other to develop this process. It's a very important process. So I think we have learned a lot this afternoon. I hope you leave with new uh, perspectives and let the role of nutritional epidemiology uh, continue um, as evidence for diet recommendations be an ongoing conversation leading us to even better recommendations. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure that uh, some of you who have been participating in this update may be ready to think about the next update. But I think with all this knowledge we have, we have learned from this update, we can really improve the next update and take, take this work for even further. But, uh, it's not time to think of that right now, I think. So finally, I would like to thank all speakers and also all the participants for being here today. A big thank you to all of you.
Thank you, Annika Solström. And now we are coming to the end of the day. Thank you. And um, yes, I also think I've learned a lot today. And would also like to thank all of you for coming and all the speakers for presenting. And we would like to thank also the yeah. Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences for housing us and arranging the symposium here. And uh, we have tried to walk through how you create scientific evidence, especially in the area of nutrition, which is difficult, and how you uh, walk from the, from the recommendations over to the food-based dietary guidelines and putting the NNR 2023 in that context and relating it to how you do it in other countries. And I hope that this is something that we've all learned a lot from. So again, thank you, all of you. And I think we've had about 150 people uh, hooking up to the Zoom. I think, Peter, that's what you told me before. It's around 200 now. Around 200, wow. So it's been really interesting. So with this, we end the symposium. And thank you, everybody.